the hour of 1130 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will come to order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Valentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will proceed. Are there any statements of disqualification that members may need to make for today's agenda? Seeing and hearing none, we will move along here. We will be moving fairly soon here to our closed session. That's when the council will go into uh, a private session to discuss matters uh, with our city attorney. So on item one on the agenda, uh, there are seven claims uh, that uh, we will be discussing. There are on item two, existing litigation and item three, real property negotiations. All of those are enumerated in the publicly uh, posted agenda. So let me see if anyone with us today wishes to make a comment on any item on our closed agenda today. Please come forward. Good morning, sir. Welcome morning. to the city council meeting. Good morning, Mayor Keeley, Thank council you. members and fellow citizens. My name is Jeffrey Dunworth and I am claimant number six. And I just wanted to discuss a um, situation where my car was towed from, I think it's called parking lot four okay. over on Cedar Street. Um, and I just moved into those new low income apartments there in April. And so I'm not really familiar with um, how everything works with like the no park when there's a, you know, an event. So there was two events, one after another, one was um, the pride parade and that was on a Sunday. And the one before was something they were doing in the parking lot there where it was like, I'm not sure what the event was called, but they're like selling clothes and stuff like that. So anyways, it was Friday night and I pulled into the parking lot and um, I saw a sign that said no parking on Sunday because of the Pride event. So I figured I was okay to park in there. And, um, and then there, there were more signs in the parking lot that said no parking Saturday but I did not see those. Um, I, I saw them, but I didn't think to read them because I had already seen the one at the, at the entry of the parking lot that said no parking on Sunday. So I was like, oh, I've already seen those signs. It's okay then, we're good tonight. So I parked there and then in the morning my car was towed. And, um, and this has just really uh, caused me a lot of financial burden. Um, cost me $500 to get it out and I, need my car because I'm an Uber driver and that's what I do for a living. So I had to pay like immediately and that, but that's caused me a lot of problems. It put me behind my rent, which is my first month paying the full month rent. So I kind of made a bad impression, I think probably on my the management. And, but now um, I'm still behind. Like I'm a, like I said, an Uber driver. So um, I'm due for an oil change and a transmission fluid change. And I just can't do it. I just, that money is gone. And um, it's just really hard to get caught up. I, moving into that apartment cost me a lot of money already. And um, I just want to see, if, like, basically, if you guys would be willing to show me mercy and reimburse me for the, for the money that I had to spend to get my car out of impound. It was just an honest mistake that I think um, anybody could have made because there were two events one day, one, one right after another, and I thought I was complying with the signs, but it was just an honest mistake. And you know, I wear glasses, so I don't, you know, I saw the signs, but I didn't think to go like stand right up to it because I, I thought I had already seen the warning, like no parking on Sunday, but apparently there was no parking on Saturday as well. So I don't know, I just want to come here today and explain what happened. And um, I'm always very compliant with the parking. You know, I, I bought um, a parking permit. You know that I, that I hang from my, my is my time up. Okay. It, it take a couple seconds to wrap okay. up. You're doing fine. Well, I just want to, um, yeah. I, I bought the parking permit so that I can park at the yellow meters, and you know that was like three hundred dollars or two hundred twenty-five dollars every three months, and so I've been doing everything that I can to comply, and um, I just made a um, an error that I think a lot of people might have made. Well, thank you so much for being here. We'll certainly consist, 
consider what you had to say when we go go into closed session. So thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to address the council on a matter in our closed session? Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? No one online. What we're going to do is we are going to go into closed session. We will return following that closed session and take up the rest of our agenda today. At this point, we stand adjourned. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session on Tuesday, June 25th, 2024. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Melantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Cooley? Here. A quorum having been established, uh, we will move to oral communications. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with oral communications, it is the opportunity for anyone to address the council for a period of time up to two minutes on an, any item under our jurisdiction but not on today's agenda uh, in the event that we have folks who would like to provide oral communication online, we will toggle back and forth between someone here present and someone online. Good afternoon, sir. Nice to see you. Welcome to the council meeting. Absolutely. Thank you. Always nice to see all of you as well. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. I guess I'm going to quote some stuff. What seems government's favorite pastime? Pretending that it and its agencies are an actual authority on anything. You know, this kind of dates some stuff. This nation was established 248 years ago when Pluto was last here. I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow and the money power of this country will en endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudice of the people until all the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the Republic is destroyed. That's 1864, Mr. Lincoln. Now, there's a couple issues with time in there. But, uh, I was going to make a really terrible comparison, but I won't. So, you know, whenever the legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people or reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves in a state of war with the people, who are therefore absolved of any further obedience and are left to the common refuge which God hath created for all men against force and violence. That's John Locke, 1641-1711. So being here, being a witness to five years of the fiduciary trust malfeasances to the people that are caused by the city, the corporation, the city of Santa Cruz, that are you guys all fawn in fear over Tony Condotti's leadership. Man, when stuff really happens, how prepared are people to really start working with each other? It's enough in brevity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Do we have anyone else uh, online? We have someone online. We'll take the person online. And good afternoon, and welcome to the city council meeting. Uh, yes. Uh, well, quick point of order. I don't believe you announced a reduction in the speaking time. It's three minutes, according to the council policy. Anyway, I watched your joint planning meeting about south of Laurel and the traffic is already a mess that I personally will always have to drive around to avoid it as I do with the downtown already. It's a terrible site locked by River Sea and the sewer treatment plant with a few transit quarters not already jammed. The mayoral idea, everything is decided, is not true. It's not over till it's over. The fact Measure M was even on the ballot tells me it isn't the people's vision. I fear what's really at the core of this is a desire for excessive control and an insatiable desire for money for the city and developers willing to sacrifice the city with density using affordable housing as a cover. There is no affordable housing. There is only market housing and socialist subsidized housing. I sure hope I don't have to pay for it. Building more housing doesn't make it affordable. It puts pressure on rents, but if the units are filled, it won't, and we will just have a far more crowded city. The mayor's uh, novel concoction of voting by consensus 
sure absolutely was an unauthorized end around of the rule of the mayor not making motions. It is not defined or sanctioned as a voting method in the council policy handbook. It is very different than the normal definition of consensus voting where appointments are filled and the number of appointment uh, applicants is less or equal to openings and approved since voting for individuals in that case moot. It's a monster stretch that you then basically approve mostly the mayor's sneaky non-motions to justify them and also approving a laundry list of directives when uh, I, uh, was, I was hearing various differing opinions and also no final document was really put before everyone to vote on. And in fact, generously, Mayor, you forgot to vote, okay? Uh, the definition, applicability, order, and uh, approval of authority for uh, any valid use of this uh, consent voting, they all need directives that don't have valid approval. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. I was asked to pass on a communication to council with translation. Please don't rebrand me. It hurts. Anyone else wish to address us under oral communication? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. This is a Serge Cagnard stepping up Santa Cruz. And I apologize, uh, I just logged on. Um, had a question about the overlook item, uh, the overlook shelter. Um, in the packet, what the we'll contract. Do, excuse me, excuse me. So, yeah, oral communication sorry. is for you to provide comment on any item under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. So, if this is on the agenda item, that is on later on our agenda, you can stay online and we'll take your comment when we get to that item. Oh, I apologize. I thought it was on the consent no, no, agenda, it, so I thought that was now. Okay, I can talk. It's quite all right. Thank you so much. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? Okay. We are on item four. This is a mayor proclamation declaring July 2024 as Parks and Recreation Month. We have a couple of our outstanding employees within the department, uh, Tremaine Hedden Jones and Annalise Bryant. Ms. Bryant, so nice to see you. Thank you for all of your good work. Thank you so much. So this is going to be a combined presentation with Trey and I. He's going to pull up a nice PowerPoint for you guys uh, highlighting Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and esteemed City Council. Um, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Tremaine Hedden Jones. I'm the Recreation Superintendent for the City of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation Department. I also have our newest Recreation Supervisor, Annalise Bryant. She's in charge of community events and classes. And today we're going to be talking about um, the importance of Parks and Recreation. Um, can I pull up the presentation now? Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties here. Still says so someone else is sharing the screen, Bonnie. It says that I cannot share the screen while someone else is sharing their screen.
Sandy, thank you. Thank you. I saw that you did that. Very kind of you. All right, thank you. We are back in the game. <laughs> so um, you can go ahead and click on the first left. So this is July's um, Parks and Recreation Month. Um, I want you to pay attention to a few of the logos that were presented on the first slide, because we'll come back to that in just a bit. But what is July's Parks and Recreation Month? It was established in 1985 um, as a celebration of everything that's related to Parks and Recreation, and it's to promote um, building a strong and vibrant and resilient communities through our, uh, what our department can offer. Um, it is also a chance and an opportunity to recognize the over 160,000 full-time parks and recreation professionals as well as their partners. Um, it was established by the NRPA, which is the National Recreation and Parks and Recreation Association, which is our national prof uh, professional society. And it was also recognized by the U.S. House um, in 2009, 2017, and 2018. So parks and recreation agencies nationwide are recognizing this month with summer programs, events, contests, commemorations, and celebrations, and that's something that Annalise will share with us in just a bit. But this is important because the services that parks and recreation professionals provide are vital to our communities, from protecting open spaces and natural resources, to helping fight obesity, and providing activities and resources for all people. This month encourages everyone to reflect on the exponential value Parks and Recreation professionals bring to communities. Next slide, please. So the National Recreation and Park Association, what again is our national uh, professional society, came up with a theme this month, which is where you belong. This is to celebrate the many ways in which our profession uh, contributes across the country to foster a sense of belonging in the community by providing welcoming and inclusive programs, essential services for all ages and abilities, and safe, accessible spaces to build meaningful connections. Most folks in our city are very fortunate because they live in close proximity to parks and other recreation facilities. Um, this helps to build higher physical activity levels for both adults and youth, and provides a connection to nature, which studies demonstrate relieve stress, strengthen interpersonal relationships, and improve mental health. Um, our agency specifically provides programs and services that are essential to this community's vitality. Um, we help people connect to nature, um, and again, we also are a strong advocate for improving our environmental condition, and we also are, um, empower our youth and our older adults to activate um, in recreation spaces. Next slide, please. So these, these are some of the top benefits of proclaiming Parks and Recreation Month. Yes, Trey said, um, he highlighted a bunch of these. So our physical and emotional, mental health and wellness was really seen during the COVID-19 pandemic and throughout the following years following that. So we are so lucky to call Santa Cruz our home and have the Parks and Recreation Department that we do have that dedicates so much of their time and livelihood to ensuring that everybody in our community has the benefits throughout our parks and recreation systems. Um, economic vitality to our communities through Parks and Recreation, we see that dramatically through weekends with Clam Chowder Festival as well as just this past weekend at Woody's on the Wharf. We see dramatic increases from visitors as well as um, economic boost from hotel sales to other areas in the area. Um, we foster cohesiveness um, and support through events like Juneteenth and our sister cities. So um, having those delegations that come to us as well as send, sending delegations elsewhere um, really can see how other people live, how other people work, and just find that cohesiveness that's best for everyone's communities. 
Uh, we sustain and steward, um, steward our natural resources. The Parks Commission is huge on that, as well as we focus a lot of that during our events in parks and highlighting our parks team that really does the best they can to enhancing our natural elements here in Santa Cruz. We also support human and community development. Um, as Trey mentioned, we foster our senior programs, our teen center, and everything in between, our class system, junior guards. Every, if there's something for everyone in our department, um, and you just can't go wrong. <laughs> And this brings us back to our organization. So um, I like to connect this back to our mission, which is to provide quality public spaces and experiences that build a healthy community, foster equity, and better the environment. We do this by tapping into the strengths of our employees and city colleagues and by establishing impactful connections with key partners. Um, if we go back to that first slide, Bonnie, you can see that the backbone of all we do are our staff, our volunteers, our interns, our partners, you as this body, the Parks and Recreation Commission, as well as the Sister Cities Committee. Combined, we're accessible in achieving our vision, which is to have a thriving system that creates recreational cultural opportunities, improve the quality of life, and strengthen the health and local environment for the economy and all. These are just a smattering of our partners that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and our programming that occurs at Neary Lagoon or over the summer, or whether it's Nueva Vista Community Resources Center over in the Beach Flats community, Shakespeare Santa Cruz, or sorry, Santa Cruz Shakespeare, <laughs> um, the Teen Center, the Civic Auditorium, De La Vega Golf Course. These are just a smattering of folks that do, we partner with on a daily basis um, to help our vision, improve our vision. And the whole gist of this is to get you guys out into the parks, to get you to enjoy everything that is why Santa Cruz exists, to be quite honest. Um, you know, so many people move to our community, not because, again, it's, you know, for a career move or, you know, they're trying to um, find a, a different, unique place to live. They're moving here because this is a, a best place to live, whether it comes to the weather or whether it's the opportunity for recreational activities, with surfing, hiking, biking, kayaking, you know, snowboarding, you know, well, maybe not snowboarding, <laughs> but we have it. And so uh, I'll at least, I'll, I'll live this with, ugh, leave this with Annalise to describe some of our events for this month. Yeah, so this is the fun part. Starting in July, we have the Junior Guards Big Swim. I really encourage you coming out on the 5th of July and coming out to the Santa Cruz Wharf around 11 or 1.30 and watching our uh, Junior Guards swim uh, off the wharf. You might even see some action at Lifeguard Headquarters, so make note of that. On July 9th, we have our Tuesday Night Live concert at the Santa Cruz Wharf featuring the Joint Chiefs at 6 to 8 p.m. That's been a really fun thing that we've incorporated over the last two years. And then on July 20th, we have a free tree walk with our very own Leslie Keedy. You can learn about our local flora. That is free, but you do need to sign up for that. Next slide. In addition to those events, we have a walking adventure group that you can do two days. It's the 16th and 18th. Again, please call to make your spot there, but that is free. And then if you want to learn all the secrets of Santa Cruz Civic, there is a backstage tour at 6 p.m. on July 9th. All you can find out information as well on our July Is page or the Santa Cruz Civic. And then Lyndon Nelson's having an open house week, which includes a ping pong tournament, singles and doubles, and that is available to sign up for now. Um, there'll also be tours and refreshments, so the actual details of that event can be found also on July's page and the Lyndon Nelson Community Center page. Now, I would be remiss and only focusing on July. Um, June had a ton of events, especially just this past weekend. So I really just wanted to highlight the work of Parks and Recreation and our partners that we had. So in June, we had one of our second concerts at the Wharf. Um, we had Juneteenth celebration at London Nelson Community Center that we've just heard amazing things about. Uh, this past weekend was big with Woody's on the Wharf. Thank you, for, uh, Mayor Keeley, for coming out that um, we had kids day as well downtown and the liberation paddle out and then our last event to kick off july is even though it's in june is going to be this saturday at lower de la viega park and it's family fun day and that is a collaboration with the county of santa cruz parks department watsonville recreation and capitola recreation so it's a day of free family fun um, there's bounce houses games activities and that has about 20 booths as well to provide free activities for our families so i encourage you guys to come there that would be from 10 a.m to 3 p.m 
And to get the full list of all of our Parks and Recreation events for July is Parks and Recreation Month, please visit cityofsantacruz.com slash July is. And without that, uh, we have some swag for our council members. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. Jeez. Uh -oh. Thank you. Mm, I guess. If I may, while you're passing that out, I just have to say thank you. I made it down to Battle of the Beaches in Capitola, and there was hundreds of our kids down there, 99% happy, 1% crying and scared, but they were pushing through. And DC was down there. He sends his regrets. He couldn't be here. He said, unfortunately, he has to work at the beach today. But I just have to commend all of the staff with their great attitudes and and um, positive spirit for keeping our youth engaged this summer, as well as all the other great benefits you mentioned, so thank you. I have sand on my feet, I told the mayor. Nobody can see from over here. <laughs> let, me, let me give the opportunity to others to comment on this. Ms. Watkins. Uh, I'll just echo what my uh, colleague said here. I mean, the, the amount of effort that you put into making this community accessible to so many people in so many different ways, in free ways, is incredible. And this year, having been through now eight of these, I, I love it. it. It's so great to, to pause and celebrate July as Parks and Recreation Month. So thank you for what you do every day of the year. And it's really a pleasure to be here to celebrate all the work in July, particularly. Other council members, thank thank you very very much for this. I know that uh, as as mayor and getting to work, go throughout the city, that how the department is sensitive to and dialed into the various component parts of our community. There's a, a neighborhood here is a bit different than a neighborhood here, so what gets offered here is a little different than that. That uh, you're very dialed in and very sensitive to the component parts that make up our city and whether it's adults or children the joy that the parks and recreation department adds to our city's uh, overall joy uh, of being in this community can't be uh, can't be uh, stated too often how important that is and what a wonderful contribution every member of the department makes all the way through i don't know that i have encountered any parks staff anywhere under any circumstances that they weren't fully engaged in what they were doing and their commitment to the community. So thank you all very, very much for that. Yay. Best wishes. Thank you. We are on presiding. Uh, those of you who are here from the Parks Department, not sure what to do at this point, <laughs> leave. <laughs> uh, it wasn't prepared. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are on presiding officer announcements. Make sure she's here. Okay. Uh, I uh, want to make a couple that are a little odd. Um, I think for a lot of people in my age group and then a little up and a fair amount down from that, um, last week was an, uh, an emotional week in the following regard that one of the folks that I think um, through his uh, athletic endeavors and through how he was as a human being at a very difficult time for African Americans in our country blazed a trail about competence and integrity and decency with people that made that person um, almost a parallel with the sport in which they were engaged. And so when Willie Mays passed at 93 last week, I know from 
uh, from Alabama to uh, all over the country. Um, there was a moment to pause and think about uh, n not only an athlete, but someone who lived in our country at a difficult time and showed through athletic competition, but how he comported himself as a man in the society over time uh, gave, I think, a lot of encouragement and leadership to other people as well. So I want to just uh, recognize the passing of, of Willie Mays. Um, I, on a much happier note, <laughs> sort of, kind of, uh, I also want to draw attention to the fact that today, uh, today's meeting is the last meeting at which we will be supported as a council uh, by our wonderful uh, uh, Deputy City Manager, Laura Schmidt. And I, I want to say that uh, I've had the great privilege of being able to be part of four different governments and four different elective offices, and I would be hard-pressed to name someone uh, better at her job, more thoughtful, more energetic and entertaining, uh, <laughs> but also uh, seriously understands the complexities of government and how to take a problem, turn it into a challenge, turn it into an opportunity, turn that into actual positive uh, action to to move this government forward in the various ways uh, that we, uh, and the various activities and undertakings which are so important to the residents, the taxpayers, citizens of our, of our community. So, uh, Laura Schmidt, uh, thank you for absolutely everything you have done. Um, I am, uh, I am sad that you are leaving. I am happy for you because uh, you have a very bright arc to your career. And the fact that we were able to share that with you for a few years in the city of Santa Cruz, I count us the lucky beneficiaries of that. And, and thank you, Laura Schmidt, very, very much. statements of disqualifications. Anyone have a reportable disqualification today? Ms. Brenner. Uh, item 17.2, 17.4, and 40 as it relates to my employment. Very good. Thank you for that. Anyone else on statements? We are on additions and deletions. Uh, let me ask Ms. Bush if we have additions or deletions to the agenda we do not. today. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney, any reports from closed session? Yes, thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Um, several items of business were discussed in closed session this morning, which was uh, commenced at 11.30 a.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room. Item one was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of John J. Morley, Luis Ramirez, Mirfak Elise Fuentes Hernandez, Barbara Jana Hostetter, David Turner, Jeffrey David Dunworth, and Progressive West uh, Insurance Company. Those claims are also listed for action this afternoon on your consent calendar as agenda item number 24. There were two items of uh, existing litigation First item was a case entitled County of Santa Cruz et al. versus Purdue Pharma LP. What this really is about is a nationwide uh, consolidated legal action brought by approximately 3,000 public entities against various uh, opioid manufacturers and distributors. Um, that case has been pending for a number of years. Uh, recently, the plaintiffs in that case reached a settlement whereby um, the company Kroger, the Kroger Corporation agreed to pay the plaintiffs <clears throat> uh, over the course of the next 11 years uh, approximately $1.3 billion uh, to settle that claim. Um, the city has an option to join in that settlement and share in the proceeds of that uh, $1.37 billion settlement and 
Um, this morning in closed session, the council approved the city's entering into that settlement agreement. Second item is a case pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court entitled City of Santa Cruz et al. versus the Regents of the University of California et al. Um, the hearing on a writ of mandate on that case was held in the Superior Court a week ago Thursday and the court took the matter under submission and this morning the council received an update from the city attorney's office on that item. Uh, there was no reportable action on that uh, litigation matter. Lastly, there were two items of real property negotiations. First property concerns the Colligan Theater uh, owned by the city of Santa Cruz and the um, city received a report from its economic development director concerning uh, potential lease negotiations between the city of Santa Cruz and three, uh, Theater 831 uh, DBA, all about theater. The second item was real property at 1070 River Street, which is referred to as the Crone House uh, in the Tannery Arts uh, facility uh, off of River Street. The uh, city is the owner of that property, and this afternoon the city council received a report from its economic development director about uh, lease negotiations between the city and the Arts Council. Um, there was no reportable action on either of those items. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, do we have uh, any items you would like to bring to our attention on the council no, calendar? No. Thank you. We're on consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar, we will be taking up items 6 through 38, inclusive, on one motion. And what we will do is I'm going to give council members the opportunity first to either pull an item comment item on or ask a question on an item on our consent agenda. I will then give the uh, public the opportunity to comment on consent. We will, I'm going to start on my right with Council Member Newsom. We'll work around the dais. Mr. Newsom, anything on consent? Um, uh, yes, I'm going to make a comment on item 17 and item 29. Comments on those? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on item 17, I just want to thank uh, Director Lipscomb and the Economic uh, Development Manager Unit uh, for this update and for this agenda item. I'm really pleased to see the progress uh, that has been made on the direction we gave uh, in January of this year on uh, for uh, our economic development strategy. Uh, and I look forward to future updates on the progress that we've made and uh, the future agenda items that are related uh, to the strategy. Uh, on item 29, I just want to thank uh, public work staff for all of their work uh, on the project and for working with uh, the neighbors on Escalona on this project, my constituents. And I want to pass along uh, my constituents' thanks for working with them on this project and for your responsiveness. Thank you and really great work on this. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you. I have a Question on 26, which I apologize for not getting in uh, sooner. And then I would just echo uh, comments of Councilmember Newsom regarding the pavement rehabilitation project. I know that there's been a lot of back and forth with neighbors, and there are some real strong feelings about that. And um, so it was really great to hear that those have been worked out. Thank you for all you do <laughs> to try to balance the... Um, you know, the, the interests there and, and get this project done. On the item 26, which this is a war for pair. Thank you. <laughs> a big thank you. This is uh, much needed. I'm so glad to see this is moving forward and um, that you've, you're on it, uh, getting the pilings. Um, I did wonder, given the timeline for the project, how the um, department plans to, um, or the depart re related departments plan to um, navigate the nesting bird uh, dynamics. I know that the, there's a, uh, an ability to work within the nesting bird timeline, and I think that it's August 15th is when that ends, but um, if the work is going to start sooner, uh, how that will be decided, who will be in that conversation. I, there are members of the public who are interested in understanding that. So I'd just love to, if there isn't an answer right at this moment, because I did just <laughs> you know, bring that up, um, I'm happy to get that afterwards. Obviously, the project is critical. Um, just wondering about that piece. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Norm Daly, Parks and Rec. Um, 
<clears throat> all the work on this project is scheduled to take place outside of the bird nesting season. Um, September 15th is the beginning of the bird season. So uh, we'll be finished uh, waves and weather permitting prior to that. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Watkins is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, I just have a few comments. I'd like to just one thank the mayor for bringing forward item 15, which is to direct or to have the mayors write a letter of support for California Senate Bill 1053 and Assembly Bill 2022-36. And they're both related to plastic pollution. Uh, there has been a loophole. I don't know if you've gone to the store and you still get a plastic bag. It's just a little bit thicker. Uh, that's been the way around. And this is trying to close that loophole so that we can reduce the impact of plastics in our lives and in our environment. And so I appreciate you bringing this for the full council to consider and fully support that. I also just want to associate myself with um, Councilmember Newsom's comments about item 17 and really thank our economic development team for all their hard work in this direction. Um, I've always sort of felt like we want to build a community that we want to see, and this is what we're doing with this. You know, we're really thinking about activation, creating spaces that people can enjoy and thrive in from our downtown to midtown to the west side eventually as well. And, um, and the update on the work is, is really great, and I look forward to hearing more along the way. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized on the consent agenda. I just have a couple of comments um, in regards to items 10 through 12. I just want to acknowledge that that's over $5 million that we're contributing towards addressing homelessness in this community. And um, it's no small feat. That's a that's a no drop in the bucket. That's a lot of money. So I just would like to acknowledge and thank people working on that. Um, the other one, I would like to thank people um, for... Uh, their work on the Westcliff Implementation Committee. Council Member um, Kalantari Johnson and I received a lot of people interested in serving in that committee, and it was a difficult decision for us to come up with a um, representative group, but we're really excited to work with those members of the community in making some actionable steps that we can um, implement in the next couple of years, hopefully, after the committee finishes their work. So thank you to everybody for all of those things. Councilmember Colantar Johnson is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you. You'll hear a little bit of repeats. Um, I have a comment on um, item 16 as well, and that's the City Council Ad Hoc Climate and Resilience Committee. I want to um, echo my thanks to the community members who reached out um, and expressed interest. I want to thank the our committee who worked on this and the staff who worked on this. Um, I'm looking forward to diving in, rolling up our sleeves, and um, working with a diverse array of community stakeholders um, on Westcliff issues and um, bringing updates for the community and the council. Um, and then related items 32, 33, 34 are all about Westcliff repairs. Just a big shout out to Public Works team. This is a huge, huge lift, and you continue to um, you know, meet the the, the climate <laughs> where it is and, and um, respond quickly, respond in a way that allows our community to access this jewel in a safe manner. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Councilmember Bruner is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to say thank you on item 15, uh, and that has already been said. And um, item 17.1 and 17.3, um, uh, I'm really happy with uh, some of the updates and progress um, and look forward to the continued work and want to thank city staff who have been working so hard on that to date. Um, and I have a question that might be, for the city attorney, um, if in the future we could separate out that those items from the rest of that direction, I know that initially it all came as one lump sum, um, but I'm I'm finding it a little um, tricky to navigate through since part of it is related to downtown and. Um, 
does impact um, my employment. So I recuse myself from that part of the, um, so I'm wondering if in the future we could separate out that in some way and, and. It, <clears throat> there certainly is no uh, necessity from a legal perspective in having those be considered as one item. So yeah, there would be no problem in separating those out. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, that was it for now for my comments. And I had no further clarifying questions. Thank you. Thank you. This would be the opportunity for anyone who wishes to provide comment on the consent agenda. You'll have uh, two minutes to do so. That includes any comments on all items on the consent agenda. Good afternoon, Mr. Ewing. Thank you, Lee. Certainly. Sure was nice to have three minutes on each. That was, that was fun. So a comment on about the wharf project number 26. I was here a couple times to hear all kinds of dialogue. A few people suggested some heavy litigation for the what seemed to be wonderful to actually strengthen one side of the wharf and then re shear the whole rest of the wharf into that. It probably would have strengthened the wharf by at least a factor of four. Fortunately, I don't think that's happening. Now, agenda item 28, which is almost 100 pages in your binder, has to do with a Blake statement about our water system. That is made by an internationally controlled individual. That's our city manager. So my concerns are there are many areas where the Environmental Protection Agency or the extermination prolifer proliferation assassins are off by more than 10,000 with the safety factors. And some of the infrastructure that's going on, we're going to be pumping over 5 million gallons of treated sewage into our water table. My understanding is that San Lorenzo watershed is valued at a billion dollars. This city has taken a access to a loan up to 125 million from the Environmental Protection Agency Bank, which polluted two fifths of the waterways in the United States and affected three fifths of the people for a train derailment that they decided to burn off that half million gallons of forever chemicals. So once again, you know, Things are just blindly not really thought about as well as they could be. And I'm just wondering what the repercussions are to have another agency control something, like who's actually pulling the switch, you know? My understanding is it takes uh, 240,000 gallons to make fluoride in the water safe. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Anyone else wish to comment on the consent agenda? This will be your opportunity to do so. Anyone online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting person online. Yes, this is Garrett. Hey, again, your only valid reason for limiting uh, public speech to two minutes is if, uh, to allow uh, many, many people to speak as if there was a long line and so forth. It's not at your whim. It's really a simple calculation. Anyway, uh, while I was mesmerized, as usual, by the ambitious climate action managers, climate frenzied, I'd say almost, uh, you know, sociopathic, perhaps career-enhancing climate change alarmist agenda of uh, item 13, I ask whether this is, again, a grant that actually requires some other staff and city money also will involve future obligations that will cost us, got me, got you. As usual, the actual application as to grant application commitments or deliverables isn't really provided to do a study with vague objectives like community engagement, request for information, and interest from energy professionals, evaluation of community and municipal buildings, developing, prioritizing, and sequencing project concepts with funding packages and creating enabling conditions for change management and accelerated deployment of priority concepts, whatever that means, all of which is hardly any kind of specific deliverable that any of you could possibly define or define the future monetary obligations that might suggest or establish a positive benefit to citizens worth the money. I would suggest as usual, taking the big outside money, especially when it involves some city cost at an unknown future cost to do their bidding, regardless of what the locals may want, is one of the reasons you never have enough money, are always looking for more money, and are always looking to expand the size and scope of government to take an ever larger bite out of the private economy, no matter what it is, and in no way obeys the simple rule of providing what the local people need, want, and are willing to pay for. 
You take the money, whether it obligates the people, never mind their need, regardless, and are slaves uh, of those other entities willing to pay more, in this case, to do their bidding, also with some of our money. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, we have one more person online. We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon. Uh, Serge Cagno, stepping up Santa Cruz. Uh, it's been a while since I spoke at city council. I apologize for um, speaking earlier. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to, um, on uh, item number 10, uh, the overlook contract, um, I was just a little confused trying to read the contract. Um, on page 14, the consultant's work plan, it says continuing operating the shelter with four staff on site, including a caregiver during every shift. But then it says two of the staff stations will be combined to require only four staff at a given time. Uh, I don't know if you've been up to the overlook. It's a little out of control at the moment. Um, and four people for 135 or so clients is... Uh, must be an awfully big challenge to do uh, oversight. Um, and then when I tried to look at the staffing to clarify, exit, exhibit B, page 16 is blank. Um, and I thought that that was part of the contract on the uh, specifics on the fees. So those were my two questions. Um, much respect for Evan Morrison and People First. Um, just wanted to understand the contract a little more. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? That's it. Matters back before the body. Motion to approve. Councilmember, excuse me, Councilmember Newsom, Councilmember Bruner seconds. Can I ask a question? Please. If there's an answer to that question that was just um, brought forward. Mr. I'll ask Wally. Larry and Wally to come up, our homelessness response manager. Thank you. Mr. M. Wally, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and members of the council. Larry and Wally, homelessness response manager. In response to that, the scope of work really is setting out minimum staffing timelines for each shift, and particularly the overnight shift does not have as many people on staff because it's not a great need, and so it's not setting a ongoing threshold for what the staffing should be. That's more the detail of all the staffing positions is um, within the budget, you can see line item for each position. And will the contract be on the city website under the homelessness page or further information? If yeah, the, the contract is on the agenda packet. I'm not sure what the issue is exhibit B that was mentioned by uh, the person making public comment. Thank you. I can clarify the question. Oh, Just Member Brown. Thank you. Um, so exhibit B in the contract that was attached to the agenda um, has a fee schedule. It, it's stated exhibit B fee schedule and it's blank. And so I think that was the question, where, where's the information due? Got it. I, yeah, I pulled up the contract. I can see that for whatever reason exhibit B is missing. We have the detailed budget contract so we can update that um, to reflect the detailed budget. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Parliamentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Consent agenda passes and so ordered. We are on item 39. Consent public hearing item, second reading and final adoption of a gas, plow, gas powered leaf blower prohibition ordinance. Items are in our packet. Ms. Uh, Dr. Wise West is here to answer any questions that we might have. I will ask if there are questions or comments by council members on this item. Seeing hearing none, I will open the public hearing. Anyone who wishes to comment on this item, this will be your opportunity to do so. Mr. Ewing, good afternoon. Yes, hello. You know, this whole green agenda, I mean, all the presidents past Kennedy, I guess that's Johnson, have been pushing this uh, democide agenda. But your guys' job is much easier just to go along and rubber stamp crap. You know, all the while, yeah, crap. And I'm going to give you an example of that. 
Recently, there's been 149 coal-fired power plants that have been put in production in China. They are saying that that puts out more CO2 than all the rest of the industrialized nations combined. But the joke is that natural volcanology produces 15 times the amount of CO2 than all of what the human beings are doing. So this green agenda is crap. Some of the quotes, a leaf blower, one hour of a leaf blower is the equivalent of driving 1,100 miles. Wow, that is really kind of wild. So what is all really going on with reducing this, the small internal combustion engines? I'm professionally, I hardly ever blow anything. I vacuum things because I work with stuff that's toxic. So it's just kind of challenging. This is another thing that's going to get rubber stamped and it's going to be quite sad. At least this was efficient. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We have persons online. We We're going to toggle back and forth between someone online and someone here present. So thank you for your forbearance. We'll take the first person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yeah, I, I can't see the timer there. Uh, but I will say if there was ever an item that demands a full public hearing and adherence, uh, ad, adherence to the council's full three-minute public agenda comment policy, it's this one. Oh, okay. I see you got three minutes because you are subjecting the public to full judicial process. Anyway, member Johnson's argument that this new crime is no different than when there was underage drinking at a house party and the property owner then should be the infraction receiving party deserves a fail in critical thinking because landscape business owners are not minors, but more so specialists and professional adult experts who should know better. Also note a landscaper may have dozens of clients allowing the possibility many property owners could be charged while the landscaper gets off scot-free uh, and charging them might have prevented all of that. The health concern analogy to smoking ban also gets a logic fail because smoking is legal on private property and really most landscapers do dial back the blower some when people are nearby. The state takes the more sensible approach banning sale and even offering buyback rebates, you offer nothing but climate praise, bum rush, fear mongering, justifications, even though the most aggressive climate goals of even 2030 can wait years for more sensible state laws to work or for this tiny contribution to help achieve those goals while in practical terms achieving pretty much nothing. Unicode enforcement allows all sorts of not particularly applicable but onerous actions like demanding private property entry or warrants to look for evidence even though you know all evidence is long gone and the vague crime of authorization may sometimes be problematic to prove if you have to. Also lacking in critical thinking was the climate master's argument a majority of cities who have bans hold the property owner responsible, which fails logic because 78% of California municipalities have no such ban at all, plus those additional more that uh, find the landscaper. As usual, it's another critical thinking fail. Uh, what other cities do, in this case a minority of such, is cited as somehow a self-standing valid reason to do anything. So why not is because, well, these other cities might employ some equally ambitious climate change hoax crisis for among the unelected bureaucrats who bamboozle their councils, caring little about the mess and cost they create. You don't want to copy that. Remember the gas stove ban? Hey, that didn't work out. Consider this. Uh, note, California is number one in having twice as many regulations as the most over-regulated state, which contributes to driving businesses headquarters, many of the most talented entrepreneurs, and young, talented families out of the state. There is uh, an issue here, whether you can actually prove others are being harmed. I'm thinking uh, not $500 worth. It's about annoyance and phony justifications. Like I said last time, I mean, if you tried this uh, banning, you know, you know, gas-powered cars, you would be, you know, strung up. Please, uh, no more overused global health smell policies, catch-all hand-waving, which we know has been misused to install systemic racism and sexism uh, into, for instance, the main code. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, I'm Carol Wilhelmy. Thank you for passing the gas-powered leaf blower ban. It's the right thing to do. Please remove all the exemptions within two years. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Next person in line. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, 
My name is Catherine Gunderson. I live near Graham Hill Road. Um, and um, I'm a retired teacher who uh, is often barraged by gas uh, leaf blowers and while sitting in my yard especially, or maybe I'm tutoring uh, kids in my backyard who are a lot more relaxed when they're outside. Um, and um, we have to go indoors, of course, when that happens. And it makes me feel extremely stressed when there's a loud blower near my house in my neighborhood. Um, and, um, you know, climate change is, is uh, a thing, a real thing. And gas blowers uh, don't really efficiently burn the fuel. A lot of it just escapes as it is out into the air. And um, also, um, there's, there's a lot we don't know about the soil. We're learning more about the soil all the time and the importance of the creatures that we either don't see because they're too small, or the relationships that they have with, uh, uh, you know, fungus, mycelium, and things like that. But um, I really think that we should, like a lot of cities have already done, um, maybe just have electric blowers. They're a lot more quiet, and they don't have that unburnt gas situation going out into the environment. And um, uh, mm. I guess that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else online? Person in line, welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chris Ryan, Santa Cruz Chase. Thank you for bringing the gas power leaf blower ordinance to a vote. And uh, thank you, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson, uh, for sponsoring this initiative. There are numerous reason to, reasons to phase out the use of gas-powered leaf blowers, which members of Santa Cruz Chase and the public at large have been citing for many years now. Suffice it to say that the emissions from two-stroke landscaping equipment are uniquely harmful to human health and the environment, and they make the emissions of a two-ton pickup truck look clean by comparison. These outdated machines increase the risk of a range of diseases, ailments, and cancers. They increase smog and contribute to climate change. Their noise disrupts and disturbs everyday life in the city six to seven days a week. And they're especially harmful to the workers who are forced to ingest their noise in toxic emissions just to earn their living. In short, it's a steep tax that everyone is forced to pay, all for moving leaves, which rakes, brooms, and battery-powered blowers can handle just fine, which we know from talking to park supervisors and crew leaders in cities that have already passed their own gas leaf blower bans. There's been $27 million in state funding already, and now there's the LEAP program for the local tri-county area with plenty of funds sitting unused, which is giving landscapers, blowers, and extra batteries at 80% off the cost. There's no more reasons anymore to allow gas-powered leaf blowers to keep taxing everyone's health and sanity. So we thank the council for passing this long overdue policy, and we hope the remaining exemptions are allowed to expire in short order. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Not this time. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, I'm uh, Nicholas Whitehead. As you can see from the color of my hair, I've had plenty of time to do yard work and other property maintenance. I please a lot of customers. Uh, but I must confess, I must confess, I have never once used a leaf blow, even when it was <coughs> offered to me. A big broom, uh, a couple of stout bags, it's amazing what you can do. Uh, and I enjoyed every minute of it, by the way. <laughs> but I just want to raise another thing. Um, some contractors, uh, landscape guys, are going to try and find a way around this. Uh, you, you need to have something in there about not bringing in a generators <laughs> to, to, to charge up the electric uh, devices. 
That, that, that's uh, maybe a bit of an outside question, but it's possible, you know. You don't want a lot of diesel, diesel fumes or other gasoline from those. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone online? Mr. Chargal, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is Modi Chargal. I'm a member of the Climate Action Task Force for the City of Santa Cruz. I'll, I'll keep this pretty quick and just say that this is a, a no-brainer, and I'm looking forward to seeing it um, pass. Um, Gas-powered leaf blowers uh, have numerous negative impacts, um, environmental, um, noise pollution, not to mention that this is an equity issue as the folks who are most likely to breathe the really toxic emissions that they generate are um, people who work in lawn care, landscaping, those kinds of things. Those folks don't pretend to be particular, uh, don't tend to be particularly affluent. Um, this is something that's pretty tricky to write and find a good way for it to work and be enforced and all of that. Um, uh, Dr. Wise West and uh, everyone else who's worked on this ordinance have done a really good job of finding something that seems like it's going to work pretty well for the community. Um, so I think it's a no-brainer to pass. I'm supportive of it, and I and I hope you can um, vote to confirm it for the, the second time. Thanks. Thank you for testimony. Thank you for your service on the committee. Anyone else wish to address us on this item? Anyone else online? Ms. Bush. Matters back before the body. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move approval. There's a motion to approve. Second. There's a second by Ms. Brown. Debate or discussion, Ms. Kalantari Johnson, on your motion. Thank you. Just um, to reiterate um, my thanks to everyone who's involved in this and Chase for the nearly decade that you've worked on this issue and, and staying patient um, as we figure out the right steps forward. Um, Dr. Tiffany Wise West and <clears throat> Bernie and all the staff who worked on it and, and um, my council colleagues on the health and all policies. Um, there may be some bumps, but we'll get through it together and um, we'll revisit it through our climate action work. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. I, I just have a, a quick follow-up uh, note. Uh, from the question that was asked by you, Mayor, uh, at our first reading, uh, I did I did have a chance to talk with the air pollution control officer at Embard at the Air Resource District, and uh, believe that there's currently almost a quarter million dollars in the fund, and he believes that they will, at least based on what he knows now, there's funding for you know two, the next two to three years to full fully funded to meet demand for the change out program. Uh, so um, just confirming that, I know that was a question that was asked. We didn't have the, the details and I wanted to share that with you all. And we're gonna keep encouraging folks to reach out and to access that program to make this transition viable. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brunner. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Brown. I had also, um, wanted to comment on that information um, and I hope that with this um, should it pass today that um, on our city end that um, we um, part of it is the communication and outreach plan that moves forward after this and so Embard currently has 44,000 for residential funding and over 230,000 for commercial funding and access is available in English and Spanish. And I would, um, I know that we had also discussed at the city level to make sure that bilingual information and access was also available. So i um, really happy that that funding component is um, hand in hand with this um, should it move forward. Thank you. For the debate or discussion. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and it's ordered. We are on item number 40. Uh, this is an action that relates to a number of parcels on Front Street and a major modification to a previously approved application. File number CP21-0051. Mr. Butler, on the item, sir. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Good afternoon, and good afternoon, council members. 
I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the City. I'm pleased to present to you today uh, regarding additional voluntary contributions that the applicant is offering related to the Cruise Hotel project that the Council approved on March 26th. The approved project includes 232 hotel rooms, parking, restaurant, bar, banquet, and other related facilities. As part of that project approval, the applicant included a number of voluntary contributions providing a range of public benefits, such as leasing no fewer than four market rate housing units and providing them at affordable rates to their employees for at least 20 years. That's in addition to their required contribution of approximately $225,000 towards the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, their voluntary contributions also include $50,000 to the Santa Cruz Hostel Society, $50,000 to the Boys and Girls Club, 10 annual payments of $10,000 each to the Santa Cruiser shuttle between the downtown and the beach. And then things like tower viewers, free public Wi-Fi and bike rentals, as well as offering reduced cost conference facilities and rooftop amenities to local nonprofits. Those are all um, voluntary amenities that the um, applicant has offered. The prior conditions also require family suites to be included in the project that can reduce costs by allowing families to rent one room instead of multiple rooms as well as prepare food in the room. All of those conditions still remain intact. What we're talking about before you today is a proposed change to the condition related to the applicant's monetary contribution to off-site low-cost visitor accommodations and a new offer of low-cost visitor accommodations within the hotel itself. To talk about the specifics related to that, I'll turn it over to Senior Planner Ryan Bain. Thank you. Can I go ahead and share now? single presentation. Why is this the case? Do people understand how to make these presentations? Why do we do this? While you're trying to find out, I'm going to say, Mr. City Manager, I would like, by the time we come back after re after our recess, this goes on every single time, and I think we need this resolved. So operationally, I would request that you do what you need to do to make sure we don't have this kind of delay every single time. Understood and agreed. Thank you. that so yes um ryan bain senior planner um, so on march you can go to the next slide um on march 26th of this year the city council approved uh, application file 221051 to construct a new 232 room hotel and following that council approval um three separate letters of appeal were received by the coastal commission appealing the coastal permit um, to the coastal commission one of the central issues uh, raised by the appeals was the project's lack of on-site, low-cost visitor accommodations. So we've been coordinating with and soliciting feedback from the Coastal Commission staff uh, on the changes to determine how best to address this issue. And applicants have offered several voluntary benefits as additions to the approved application's previous conditions of approval, um, some of which um, uh, Director uh, Lee had just uh, mentioned. So. Um, so discussion with Coastal Commission staff has been ongoing. Um, 
and as of even the last few days, and some revisions to the conditional uh, language was recently amended since the council packet went out. So I'm gonna go through some of those uh, changes, uh, red line changes with you. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in response to the appeals to Coastal Commission, the applicants are proposing modifications to the previously approved condition number 84 um, to include additional voluntary benefits and modify some of the language for simplification. Um, this added language to 84A is in place of 84C, um, which was a little complex in how it was written. Um, it's the next slide, but we don't need to go to it quite yet. Um, so instead of 3,650 guest nights per year and so many nights quarterly, um, it now states a simplified 10 low-cost uh, rooms daily. So um, the, the added language here to A in red, uh, that's redlined here, uh, is in replacement of um, the previous 84C. Uh, and if you want to go to the next slide, you can see 84C, a little complex, that's no longer um, a part of the condition. Want to go to the next slide? Thank you. <clears throat> so this uh, 84B, some slight language changes. Um, really, this had more to do with um, how the in-lieu fees were handled. Um, Apparently, with the State Coastal Conservancy, which was originally going to be handling the in-lieu fees, um, they have a administration fee, like a 10% administration fee. So um, instead of any of those funds going to an administration fee, the city is going to be handling those in-lieu fees instead. So the red lines here basically um, cover those changes as to how the in-lieu fees will be handled and by the city. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this This... There's very minor changes here. Really, it just has more to do with um, uh, how, in terms of the subsections are uh, defined. Next, next slide, please. And then this last uh, 84E was added um, recently, just in terms of any amendments that may come in the future and how the, how that's to be handled. Uh, next slide. So um, even though the City Council Action Day is limited in scope with respect to updating the public benefits offered by the applicant, um, should the Council approve the changes today, today, the City will be rescinding the prior final local action notice, or, or FLAN, that was sent to the Coastal Commission for the uh, Council's uh, prior approval. Uh, and we will issue a new FLAN for the Coastal Commission, and this, will, and this approval, should the Council approve this today, will replace this previous one. Uh, since this action was adding to the prior conditions. Thus, the prior appeals to the Coastal Commission will be, would be nullified. Anyone interested in appealing the project to the Coastal Commission would need to file a new, new appeal, and for purposes of said appeal to the Coastal Commission, it would be the entire project that's being appealed to the Coastal Commission, even though today's action is really limited in scope. Um, city staff has contacted the three appellants to make them aware of this. Next slide. So um, staff is recommending that the council adopt the resolution approving the application based on the findings and conditions of approval provided. And uh, I'm available for any questions. Questions by members? Ms. Brown. Thank you for the presentation and the clarifications. Um, and especially appreciate that you have reached out to the appellants because that was not necessarily what was being communicated um, by the Coastal Commission about what this action would mean. And I know that the city has some authority in how that plays out. So as I understand it, this is a, a supersede kind of action that you're, we're taking. Um, so even though it's a modification to one of the conditions, um, even where there are appeals related to other elements of the project, those would need to be resubmitted for, and that's in the so that's for the city's position that that you're taking okay so i just wanted to that's that's helpful and clarifying that we weren't sure um what was going to happen there <clears throat> uh, my other question is really a big one and i don't ask this to sound um like a jerk <laughs> or <laughs> overly naive um but i really want to ask why are we doing this um <laughs> why are we doing this here at the city council when the, uh, you know, the, the matter of low-cost accommodations, which I imagine we all are very interested in here, um, is, is a coastal 
Commission authority question. Um, and some of us here, uh, at least one of us who's left here, have you know concerns about the project overall. I've, I think my record's been clear on that. But I'm I'm just curious as to why this wouldn't just get worked out at the commission level. Thanks for that question, Councilmember Brown. Um, so. The applicant is within their um, authority to request changes to projects. Um, you know, that is a fairly common occurrence through minor modifications or major modifications, as you're, you're aware. Um, so um, with, the, um, uh, with the appeals that came in, the applicant requested changes. Um, so we have a process whereby we can go through those changes. Um, I think getting at kind of the heart of your question, why are we here in front of the city council? Um, we could have processed this as an administrative approval. However, given that this was a, a issue that was raised as part of the, um, uh, the initial hearing, as well as part of the appeals, we wanted to be not only transparent about the changes that were occurring and um, having an, uh, a public hearing related to those, but also wanted to offer the opportunity for members of the public to speak on this um, and provide uh, comments on it. And so this forum provides that opportunity for members of the public to comment on the proposed changes. I, I think I'll leave it there for now. I may have follow-up questions when we come back. Questions, further questions or comments by members, if I could. If I understand it correctly, Mr. Butler, we are trying to do those things that we believe, given that this body has approved this project, that will now meet additional concerns raised by a combination of appeals on this issue and the Coastal Commission staff review of those appeals. Is that right? That's correct, Mayor. Specifically related to the low-cost visitor accommodation. I'm sorry. I, I spoke over you. I'm sorry. Sorry. Specifically related to the low-cost visitor accommodations. Yes. So uh, if the City Council adopts this action, is it your understanding that the Coastal Commission staff will say there's no substantial issue, the City has addressed the issues on appeal, and, and coastal staff in the city are in lockstep at the commission on the question of low-cost visitor accommodations? That's a great question, Mayor. Um, I would not go that far. Um, we have not had that um, firm commitment from the Coastal Commission staff at this point in time. What we have, what, what, what I can say is that we have shared this information. Um, uh, the applicant and the city staff have had multiple meetings, including as recently as yesterday, on uh, the proposed revisions, um, including um, a, a series of revisions um, based on questions that the Coastal Commission staff has had and comments that the Coastal Commission staff has had. Um, our goal, of course, is to get to a no substantial issue recommendation and a no substantial issue determination by the commission. And this, uh, these changes are in an effort to um, achieve that goal. I, I can't speak as to whether or not we don't, we don't have the affirmation that, that is um, where the staff will go, um, but this is certainly um, helping our case um, in um, achieving such recommendation from the commission staff. So not too long ago, the commission took up the issue of low-cost visitor accommodations as they related to a project called the American Tin Cannery on Cannery Row in Monterey. Is that correct? That is correct. And in that process of approval of that application, they came to agreement with the Tin Cannery, they being the Coastal Commission, and the Tin Cannery on how to handle, in that case, the low-cost visitor accommodations, correct? That is correct. Okay. When the and now the Coastal Commission is interested in having this project uh, similarly meet some standard with regard to low cost visitor accommodation, correct? Or correct. Some, some policy, some desire. standard, and, and looking at a package of so I'm going to go to that question because it seems to me that there are items that are very distinguishable between American Tin Cannery and this application. First of all, it's at the cannery on Monterey Row, or the uh, Cannery Row in Monterey. That's a Monterey 
uh, is a very, very high cost visitor accommodation community. And so I understand how uh, that, that given the commission's desire to see more coastal access and in the case of a hotel, not only can't block the access to the coast, but actually the hotel itself creates access for low cost, for folks of lower income to be able to have access to the coast, not only the ocean itself, but, but amenities in the coast. Is that the commission's general concept here? That is, they're just looking to see how they can increase the visitation, particularly by um, those um, with uh, lower incomes. Is the commission at all, do you have any reason to believe the commission is all interested in any given application uh, about what the low cost visitor accommodations are currently in that community? That's a great question, Mayor, um, because that is something that we have had conversations with the Coastal Commission regarding, and it's something that we have in our adopted local coastal program. So our adopted local coastal program speaks to the fact that we have many low-cost accommodations throughout the city, and it actually encourages higher-cost uh, accommodations while also protecting and preserving the existing lower-cost accommodations that we have. And so that's certainly a point that we have been making and will continue to make because uh, you're absolutely right. I, I don't know the exact price point of the American Ten Cannery um, uh, hotel project, but you know those rooms, I would guess, are going at you know, close to, if not double, the rate that we would anticipate for this um, this location. And it's a, it's a different environment in terms of the um, types of hotels that are available throughout that community as compared to the offerings that we have here and the many low-cost accommodations that are available in the city. The, uh, do you know whether or not the Coastal Commission or the Coastal, Michigan, Coastal Commission staff take into consideration on this low-cost visitor accommodation principle of theirs uh, what else is going on in that community? Let me give you the example that is abundantly clear here. And we'll go back to the, the Monterey end of the bay versus the Santa Cruz end of the bay. We are the blue collar end of the bay. They are a very high end visitor accommodating end of the bay. Their stock of hotels, motels, and other ways to stay in Monterey is a much higher priced product than the dozens and dozens and dozens of relatively lowish end motels that we have had in this community for decades. So I'm wondering if the goal, what is the goal of the Coast Commission? Uh, do they take into consideration whether or not a community already has low cost visitor accommodations? I would hope so. Um, and I also think that it is a core part of their mission to enhance um, low-cost visitor accommodations. And so I, I don't think that um, at this point in time the, the commission would have no interest in, in having any type of um, uh, low-cost accommodations in the project. And I think um, you're you're seeing the applicant um, uh, uh, recognize that fact in the expanded conditions that they're offering um, as, as part of your uh, package today. The uh, when this left us on a previous occasion, we'd taken what I thought was our final action on it. We moved on now as matters for the Coastal Commission. I have a recollection that we were not exactly silent on this question when the matter was in front of this body regarding low-cost visitor accommodations and that there were several million dollars worth of low-cost visitor accommodations put on the table. You're is that correct? That what is was, correct. What was that? The prior condition of approval um, had a, um, a per room charge um, and there was a formula um, from recollection it was about $144,000 per room if you give me just a minute but roughly um, and then they were subtracting out um, some of the other contributions that they were making, the value of those contributions. So um, rather than that formula, so to give you an idea, that 
would have calculated out to around $5 million, um, but would have required a formula of, of how much is uh, the value of various other um, amenities that they're offering. And so rather than have that formula, they have just offered, they have eliminated the formula and just offered the $5 million contribution. That continues to be anticipated to go towards um, the Greyhound Rock uh, low-cost accommodations in North County, in North Santa Cruz County. Um, so, uh, And there's also an ability for that to transition to another use if the Greyhound Rock uh, facilities do not come to fruition. I have a question about that. Sure. Why would we entertain a... Why would we, when we're approving a land use prop, proposal in the city of Santa Cruz impose on even with their agreement a condition that a private developer make a five million dollar contribution to something far outside the city why wouldn't we do that we have plenty of issues in the city that could benefit from a five million dollar contribution for low-cost accommodations why are we going outside the city so I I'd, I'd, uh respond with a couple of things there. Um, one, I want to point out that um, that contribution was a voluntary um, contribution that the developer offered. Um, we had uh, indicated that, um, you know, pursuant to our approved local coastal program, uh, um, it, it, that local coastal program encourages um, us to develop additional um, moderate and higher cost hotel facilities. And so as such, um, on its face, the project absent that condition still was consistent with the local coastal program. Um, and we had these conversations with the applicant about, well, there's likely going to be at the Coastal Commission a desire for additional levels of low-cost accommodations. And ultimately, that's what the applicant proposed. With respect to your question about the location of that, um, what we're really focused on here is um, accommodations, um, so overnight accommodations. And we've got the Santa Cruz Hostel Society here that um, can benefit from and is in need of some uh, maintenance and up upkeep to um, uh, continue providing those low-cost units. But um, the Greyhound Rock uh, presented itself as an opportunity where um, there could be a uh, substantial uh, new um, low-cost visitor serving accommodation facility uh, within proximity um, and um, you know the five million dollars while it's a significant amount if if there was the acquisition of property and the development of new property that would be um, challenging to do with just the, the five million dollars um, so all of that um, was taken into consideration um, when that location was identified and um, there's a representative from the applicant here who can speak to that further in terms of how they ultimately landed on that um, recommendation. Do, are you aware of who or which entity originally proposed the Greyhound Rock option? Did um, that come from the applicant, the county, the city, the man on the moon? I, I believe that stemmed from conversations with the between the applicant and the county. The applicant and the county. Thank you. Let me ask you another question. Um, when we oh, are... Hey, um, it, yes, please. The, Co the Coastal Commission staff um, had also made that suggestion is what the applicant originally indicated. made the suggestion. The Coastal Commission staff um, had made that suggestion. The origin, the origin of Greyhound Rock is the, is the Coastal Commission staff. That's what I'm hearing from the applicant. Thank you. Do you know how they came up with that idea? Um, I don't, but um, I know we haven't opened the public hearing. Um, if I think that's a good question for the applicant. They know, they know more about that than... Let me ask another question. As the Coastal Commission is examining now whether what was submitted before, what if we take an action today, uh, let's say for sake of discussion we approve this, off it goes. 
what uh, objective existing standard uh, are we trying to comply with at the commission? When the commission said we want low cost visitor accommodations, what is the the metric by which either that we know of and we can then size our actions to achieve their goals? What is the precise metric or policy that is uh, defined in some detail that we are trying to help, we and the applicant are trying to get to so that the coast, we meet the Coastal Commission standard? I'm assuming if they have a standard, they have a metric. That's a great question, Mayor. And um, unfortunately, I would say it's not um, specifically well defined and it can vary. And I will say that they have used in the past a 25% metric of um, 25. So you have 100 rooms, you look at 25 of them being available to um, low cost um, accommodations, which is. They, have a, they do have a metric as it relates to that, that 75%. How would what's in front of us today hit or not hit that objective? Well, what, I would, what I would say is um, when they are evaluating that objective, they look at the entire package of, of uh, information that is in front of them. And so, um, for example, the American Tin Can Company um, in Monterey, um, my understanding is they did not have 25% there, but they offered additional items. And um, that is what you see. And that, that's part of the reason why I mentioned in my introductory comments the various things that the applicant is doing, um, both from the affordable housing side of things, also to the contributions to the Boys and Girls Club and the Santa Cruz or public transportation and so forth. And so. So really the way that we are looking at this and encouraging the Coastal Commission to look at this is not as a singular issue but as a package because the, the project is also doing things like expanding the uh, river walk and offering more um, publicly accessible space adjacent to the river there as well which has cost components in addition to the direct monetary offerings that they're providing as well as the Paseo. Um, on the, the north side and, and working with us on that. Thank you. Further questions by other members? Ms. Brown. I, I do have a follow-up. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm um, sort of responding to some of the things that I've heard you say, Mr. Butler, and your questions, Mayor Keeley. Uh, I, I want to say that um, I think that's right, What your 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 impression of the Coastal Commission staff looking at the full package. I mean, if you look at the Tin Cannery and the Dana Point project and, you know, any of the recent hotels, that's the way that they've been uh, working through those. And it's, they're not all on-site, low-cost nights. Um, we hear commissioners say that's their priority, at least some. So, um, you know, in the chair in particular, I've heard her say that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to my... Um, our supervisor who's on the commission. Um, <clears throat> what I see here is just a real back of the envelope is like about 4% of the room is with the, with the 10, either 3,650 three, six, 3, or 10 nights, however that formula is made to work out so that the rooms are available across the the year and not just all in the middle of winter, um, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, and I think that's a, an, an an improvement, but it really is about 4%. So just to kind of respond to your question, if the Coastal Commission standard is 25% and the this low-cost accommodation proposal is 4%, and it would be probably another 4% of the $5 million going to um, off-site uh, nonprofits. I think that it's worth just thinking about that. So I'd, um, it's sort it's a question, it's a comment, but it's kind of a question of you know <laughs> what do people think about that? I'm, I, I'd like to maybe hear from the developer about the rationale for um, this number of nights vis-a-vis -vis what the Coastal Commission has kind of identified as 
you know, what they think is the priority. I only, I'm asking this not because this is not my wheelhouse. I, I, I was fighting for affordable housing here on the site, and I wanted to fight for more affordable housing and, you know, provided by the developer in this project. So that's really my concern. We're past that at this point, um, at least with this body. But I do think since we're back here to talk about low-cost accommodations, it would be helpful to hear a little bit from the developer about that rationale um, and, you know, where if there's any, if you have any intention of going anywhere else with this but when it comes before a different body, <laughs> I guess. Um, I just, I'm trying to understand, you know, how, how the, because I, it seems like it's been brought to us to try to m kind of move this through, and I think that's, you know, now that we're going down this road, it's important to, um, you know, to not cause uh, unnecessary delays, and this just feels to me like it might be an additional delay. So, um, but voluntary on the part of the developer. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So if you have anything you want to share about that, it would be helpful. Um, if not, you know, I'm, it, that's not a decision that, you know, it's not, that's not going to cause me to change my decision here, but it's, I'm just curious um, about, you know, making this happen, if that's the goal. It seems like it is. That is the goal. Um, with respect to the offerings, you know, I would defer to the applicant, and when they have their presentation, I have an opportunity to speak to that. Okay. And we're going to get that? That's, that's happening? Yes. Oh, sorry. I, I, I thought you were, that was it. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm going to stop it. asking questions now. <laughs> the applicant's representative is here, um, and I, he actually, I just conferred with him on the response to the mayor's prior question about the, the Coastal Commission um, and the Greyhound Rock. Okay, I'm going to, I'll just, then if you could just, instead of having to forecast what my question will be, there it is, <laughs> as you make your presentation. Thank you. We're going to go out to public comment at this point. We'll return. The matter will come back to the body. We can ask additional questions. This will be the opportunity for anyone to address us on this matter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Hector Aspilcueta, and I'm an organizer with United Here Local 19. Uh, the Hospitality Workers Union that represent workers on the central coast of California. Uh, we urge you to refrain from approving the changes presented today because of the provisions for lower costs of night accommodation are grossly inadequate. Typically, the Coastal Commission requires 25% of new luxury rooms to be affordable, which here will be 58 lower cost rooms for the proposed 232 rooms luxury cruise hotel. Instead, the developer has proposed providing low-cost rate rooms for a minimum of 3,650 guest nights per year, which amounts to just 10 affordable rooms per year. Even if you make a minimum of 912 rooms available each fiscal quarter of the year, as proposed by the developer, this is still equates to only 10 rooms. 10 lower-cost rooms is far below the standard of 58 lower-cost rooms that should be provided. Additionally, the developer has also stated that the undeserved communities should have access to the double occupancy rooms at the minimum, at the minimum operation cost for a minimum of 150 guest nights per year. However, it is unclear if this is in addition to the 10 rooms previously mentioned. Furthermore, the developer should commit to clear lower cost obligation in the form of actual rooms that can be easily verifiable. No guest nights which is sustainable to ambiguous interpretation and more difficult to verify as being genuinely made available at a lower cost. Mayor Keeley and council members, please refrain from approving these changes without asking the developer to provide the appropriate 58 real lower cost rooms as what is proposed is insufficient for visiting working families. Thank you. Thank you. We have anyone online, Ms. Bush? We do. We'll take next person online, then we'll be right with you. First online, good afternoon and welcome. Yeah, sure. This is good. Hey, uh, as to item 40, the conditions of approval, uh, you have the owner obligated to uh, begging customers to contribute to your various social causes. Really? Uh, you know I don't like extortion, and California is by far at least double the most regulated state in the country, and I've guessed many, many times that and farcical concessions and regulations as conditionals 
conditions of approval for anything. Also, a great many of these conditions are really covered already by prior regulations, and some are a little big brother like video surveillance. Item number 77, of course, is mostly pure extortion as the applicant made no such a original self-offered voluntary agreement to this entire wallet pinching buffet, except being held up a la bandito as a condition of final approval. Free bike rides to visitors for 90 minutes, free access to the hotel's rooftop facilities and conference facilities for nonprofits, many interior design whims of yours devoid of real justification, some socialist price fixing of accommodations, 10,000 a year to support an EV bus that currently doesn't even stop by the hotel. It's like sharks at an authoritarian money feeding frenzy, but I do like the imaginative cool hotel concept, especially since it's on the other side of the world for me and I can drive around it. At least there are only 84 conditions of approval besides the normal building approval. Maybe the developer should be grateful there aren't 584. I have great confidence you'll squeeze this as hard as you possibly can, no matter what the cost is to full fare customers. I like some of your questions. It's not all criticism. I mostly like the project. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Celica Valdez, and I am an organizer with Unite Here Local 19. The developer of the Cruz Hotel is here yet again without a plan that properly addresses the project's insufficient amount of on-site lower um, cost, accommodation, or cost overnight accommodations. Recent, the recent modifications in the conditions of approval do not address the Coastal Commission's typical practice of requiring 25% low-cost accommodation in new luxury hotels. Offering only 10 standard double occupancy rooms per year falls far short when the minimum should be 58 rooms, which are desperately needed for working families who visit Santa Cruz. Among the changes, the disheartening to know the in lieu fee for low-cost visitors' accommodations has once again been reduced. In previous stages of the project, the fee was projected to be 8.38 million. This figure was subsequently reduced to 5.17 million and has now been further reduced to 5 million. Clearly, the developer of the Cruz Hotel wants to preserve the exclusivity of this project by not providing sufficient low cost overnight accommodations, especially considering that the proposed average daily, route, daily rate will be 330 being $40 above the cost of commission, commission's anticipated high cost threshold. Mayor and city council members, please refrain from approval these modifications without first requesting the developer to include sufficient amount of on-site lower cost overnight accommodations. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online? We'll take the next person online, then we'll be right with you, sir. Next person online, welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. My name is Jordan Sisson. I'm a CEQA land use attorney. Speak on behalf of United Here Local 19. Unfortunately, the modifications before you today does not address our concerns that were the subject of our appeal to Coastal Commission, and we still believe there's a substantial issue. In my limited time, I'm going to highlight five very quick issues. First, these modifications were only made known to us with the release of the staff report and today's presentation. Second, the 10 Cannery project was approved only after being significantly revised and after the commission found a substantial issue. Also, requiring 25% of new luxury rooms is not unique to the 10 Cannery or Monterey County. It has been used for numerous projects up and down the coast. Third, the six family suites you heard earlier have not been adequately conditioned to be made available at lower cost levels which under past Coastal Commission practice would be 75% of the statewide rates with a slight 10% increase for each occupant beyond two guests. This should be addressed in a revised condition to make those six family suites really lower cost. My fourth point is that 10 lower cost rooms, which was just announced today during the staff, post the staff report, is woefully below the 58 rooms typically required under Coastal practice. As you heard, there's a clear uh, standard that has been used often, and that'd be 50 rate, 58 rooms, not 10. 
Fifth, as you heard earlier, the in-lieu fees is being reduced yet again. Originally, it was over $8 million. And in March, it was reduced down to $5.17 million based off of over a $3 million credit. This is now further reduced down to $5 million. This is still a $1.6 million shortfall under the developer's new proposed proposal of 10 lower cost rooms. Bear in mind, based off of the applicant's own math back in March, you assume the six-family suites are actually lower cost and the 10 lower cost rooms that are now being proposed, you still have a shortfall of 46 lower cost rooms. Coastal Commission found a rate of about roughly $1,045,000 per lower cost room. And you times that by the amount of lower cost rooms that are required. That comes out to $6.6 million, not $5 million. In closing, we respect uh, the decision before you, but there is clear evidence that this is not consistent with the Coastal Act. We respectfully request you reject this amendment until it provides either all of the on-site and lower cost rooms on-site or pay the full in lieu fee. I thank you for your time and I wish you the very best with your decision. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon, <coughs> council members. My name is Luis. I'm an organizer on Local 19. I live in Hollister. Um, the city of Santa Cruz must ensure to everyone to have access to the state on the coast. Approving a luxury hotels with a minimal lower cost accommodation sends a strong message to the coastal access is reserved for the wealthy. Hospitality workers can afford to stay at the hotel they are working out. And the Santa and the Cruz Hotel will be the exception. <clears throat> I would like to add, um, for all the working people we live of the town to be able to visit the Santa Cruz, but that one possible without on-site lower cost accommodations. Council members, I respect you as to <clears throat> that your request to developer to create sufficient on-site lower cost overnight accommodations for working families who want to visit the Santa Cruz, which stayed at downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone online? No. no. Thank you very much. Good evening. Or, excuse me, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, City Council members. My name is Martha. I live in Santa Cruz, and I have worked at Dreaming as a housekeeper for 28 years. As a resident of Santa Cruz for several decades, I am disappointed in the decision to approve the sale of public land for a luxury hotel. It is even more disappointed to know why you have continuously let the developer put a price tag to the lack of sufficient on-site lower cost overnight accommodation. The changes in the condition of approval here today um, are nowhere near enough consider, considering that there will be a total of 232 rooms. I want my family from out of town to have the same opportunity as someone who easily afford to spend 330 for one night. Council members, I respectfully ask that you request the developer to make the cruise hotel accessible for all by adding more on-site low-cost overnight accommodation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you, Mayor, Council members. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Pomerantz. <clears throat> As you are now fully aware, there has been three appeals since your approval of the Cruise Hotel back in March, all three of which are strongly in favor of low cost, providing lots of low cost visitor accommodations. The proposal before you, as stated by HERE and the representatives, is wholly inadequate. We also believe that and I would think the other appeals. I hope you will read the appeals so you'll get a stronger feel for what has been stated in there. It's hard to judge. I, your red 
thing that you put up, I haven't been able to stomach the, the changes that you've made since, since it was uh, publicly presented as a packet. So it's hard to speak exactly how inadequate it is. Maybe it's improved, maybe it's not. I, I don't know. I, I think more time is necessary for people to fully read that and analyze it and understand what's being asked. <clears throat> the developers were real clear at your meeting that the hotel was approved. When you approved it, that there was no way they were going to provide on-site accommodations. Instead, they'd give a few uh, pesos for the accommodations at Greyhound Rock, which seemed to come just out of nowhere. Um, that, that's 30 minutes up the coast. How is that going to provide adequate low-cost visitor accommodations for people coming to Santa Cruz? <clears throat> now, miraculously, they're going to provide some of these accommodations on site. What else are they being disingenuous about? 25% of the rooms as affordable is what you should be approving today as a condition of approval, as the, as the Coastal Commission staff has implied. <clears throat> the council needs to be aware that there are other important grounds that you haven't been presented today that are in these appeals, of which I am a part of that appeal, one of the appeals. They should have been addressed on this agenda item, such as affordable housing and parking for hotel workers, public benefits, like access and recreational opportunities, protection of coastal resources. These all have, are needed for you to address. I request you deny the applicant's proposal for low-cost affordable accommodations as wholly inadequate, at least until it can be digested what changes have been made. Have staff bring them all back, all these other appeals that, are, that have been presented to them. You should know about it. This, along with the other grounds of appeal and the Coastal Commission staff, please read the attached appeals. We've presented ours. It's in your packet. I hope you'll have time to do that, and I thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you, Mr. Pomerantz. Do we have anyone else online? No. Good afternoon, sir. My name's Lee Brokaw. I'm a general contractor. I've been in the trades for 43 years. I've built with a license for 36. I have dealt with foundation drains on simple residences. You have buildings along the levee that have, some of them have three-story deep basements, and there will be foundation drains down there in order to keep the water out of those parts of the buildings. That water will be pumped by a diesel pump 24-7, 365, for as long as we are alive or beyond. And where is that water going to go? It's going to go into the river. And I don't have any fish noises to go along with my speech today. Um, that water will contain fertilizer from the landscaping because I'm sure you will require, most projects do, a certain amount of landscaping. And in order to make it look good year round, they'll have to fertilize. The rainwater will push that down to the foundation drain. It will pump. Where do you think they're going to pump that water? into the river. Those nitrates in the fertilizer will kill the oxygen in the river. We will have algae blooms and we will have dead fish and it will all go out into the ocean. I have heard no one talk about this and this is absolutely critical for climate change, the environment, and for the health and safety of this community. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Doug Block. I'm also with Unite Here Local 19. Mr. Mayor, our business manager and your friend, Enrique Fernandez, sends his regards. Thank you. As you've heard, our members live and work in this community, and we are concerned not only about this project, but many other issues. We are concerned about affordable housing. We are concerned about being able to afford to enjoy this beautiful coast and the amenities that it provides. And we are concerned about jobs. Let me express our disappointment that being members of the community, the developer did not meet with us prior to coming forward with these amendments. And as we look at the proposed amendments, we wonder 
who did the developer meet with? And while we appreciate this agenda item and your consideration of it, as has been expressed today, ultimately this will come down to a decision of the Coastal Commission about whether the amendments are adequate or not. For our part, we would welcome the opportunity to meet with the developer prior to that vote, and we would respectfully ask for you not to approve this item today and leave the Coastal Commission the job of doing the business that we appoint them to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Anyone else wishes to provide comment on this item? Matters back before the body. The vice mayor is recognized. I'd like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. There is a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Council Member Watkins. Madam Vice Mayor, you may open on your motion. I just would like to take a second to um, address some of the inaccuracies that were kind of brought by uh, the speakers. I appreciate you coming. Um, I've looked you guys up. You, 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 your local union, Unite, I don't see any hotels in the city of Santa Cruz that you work with. Maybe your website's not up to date. But I must say, when we sold the public land, that was a while ago, and it was a, such a small parcel, it was undevelopable bull for, for um, the purposes of affordable housing. Our city has done a fabulous job of meeting our arena numbers at every um, income level. I'm really proud of that. But we also need income. And some of the income comes in the form of TOT and visitor tax and having people come um, visit our wonderful city. From my perspective and from looking online, when I see um, luxury hotels in our town, I wouldn't say any of them are particularly luxury, but I'd say the nicest one would be the Dream Inn maybe the Chaminade, which isn't even in the city. We've got the new La Quinta and the Marriott, which I would say are probably mid-range. And then the vast majority of hotels, with, since the La Bahia is not online yet, are really low-cost accommodations. The Paradox, maybe that one's a little bit mid-range also, but I would say most of them are motels. They're old, they're run down, and their rates reflect that. They're super accessible for the tourism market that we have in this community, which is typically a drive market where people aren't coming from international places. It's typically people within the state that are driving here. Like the mayor said, we're a blue collar destination. And I think our visitor accommodations show that. We also have to understand that if we have more low cost on site, with anything, economics has to equal out. So then the other costs are gonna be so high that it will be completely unaffordable to a, a middle income family, which I think $300 a night, if that's the cost, that's what I would expect to pay going on vacation at the kind of level of accommodations that my family's accustomed to stay. I, wouldn't, I couldn't afford you know, $500 a night, but $300, that seems reasonable and affordable for people in the middle class demographic that I'm part of, lucky to be part of. Having said that, I also think that when people want to come here and pay more, let's capitalize off that. Let's have nicer restaurants. Let's have other things. Those pay the bills so that we can have uh, affordability for everybody. And so I'm really impressed with how the applicant has gone, I feel, above and beyond to make this project work. Frankly, I think that reading the Coastal Act, this is kind of a far reach and a stretch. You still have plenty of access to the coast. This is just barely inside the coastal zone. And so um, I think it's a little absurd that we're spending so much time talking about it, quite frankly. And so I would like to um, say thank you for bringing the project and sticking with it. And I, I look forward to you know seeing the amenities that the hotel brings to town. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I, there's not really much to be said here. I kind of commented and, and tried to ask a question, and then I heard, I thought the developer was going to come up and speak, but we didn't get that. So now um, I'm, I'm not going to belabor this. Um, I know where the council stands on it, but I, I will say that um, perhaps the Coastal Commission staff recommended Greyhound Rock. That is a, um, I happen to be involved in negotiations over getting that property at the county end, um, not negotiations over how it's going to be funded. I'm not involved in those conversations, but um, it, it seems a stretch to me. Um, 
and I, appre I do appreciate the um, develop the applicant's willingness to consider on-site bed nights because we had heard that wasn't possible and um, some of us believe it's always possible you know the the, the particulars may um, need to be negotiated and so I'm glad to see that that's a conversation that's been opened up as I suggested earlier and you've heard from members of the audience who are paying close attention to this um, it, it it may not be sufficient so um, I'm not going to be supporting the motion, uh, not because of the low-cost accommodation work that's been done. I, I do appreciate an improvement here, um, but because I, I don't support the project and I haven't, and so I'm not going to start now. Um, so I, I just um, just wanted to say that, and um, you know, good luck with the um, next steps. For the debate or discussion. Uh, Mr. Butler, uh, on more than one occasion during the testimony, the notion of was referenced that there is some kind of obligation or standard to re regarding 25 percent. That was mentioned by various folks who provided testimony. What is that? I can't find that in our packet that there is some 25 percent standard that relates to something on this. Thanks for that question, Mayor. That's related to the Coastal Commission and one of the approaches that they often will look at would be um, for luxury hotels having 25% of the room set aside for low-cost visitor serving accommodations. Does, is that someplace in, either in the Coastal Act or the regulations or where, where's that? The Coastal Act says that the um, the, the Commission part of the Commission's role is to promote low-cost visitor serving facilities um, the um, Commission has um, looked at that um, and Consistently indicated that is uh, Stress has consistently stressed that that is also um, low-cost visitor serving accommodations like overnight facilities um, and not just um, facilities like our wharf, which is low cost, and um, you know other uh, amenities that we have along our coast. So I'm still not clear. Is there a 25 percent standard someplace in the Coastal Act or in the Coastal Regulations? I do not believe it is in the Coastal Act. They have um, policies that they have um, sought to implement in uh, um, in relation to the Coastal Act, but I do not believe that it is um, specific to the Coastal Act itself. So when you take the, if we approve this motion and you take the, everything that could be loaded into the stack called low cost visitors accommodation funded by this project in all of its ways that are in here, this number of nights a, week, a year here, the money to Greyhound Rock there, the whatever, that stack comes up to what? So um, are you asking if, if the cost is equivalent to 25%? I don't want to be mysterious about this. If they have something that the custom and practice there, it doesn't sound like it's in a standard, and it sounds like it's more like custom and practice over at the commission. Uh, if you come in with, and I'm also interested in what they think a luxury hotel is, I mean, would they require this on any hotel or motel that came along, or is this, you know, affect uh, what has now been tagged a luxury hotel? And I'm not sure how we define luxury hotel, except uh, pejoratively. But uh, do you have a is is there a standard for luxury hotel in the Coastal Act? Number two, is there a 25 percent obligation when you're proposing such things to meet? low-cost visitors accommodation let's get done with those two then I have other questions sure. so it's their uh, the policy that they utilize um, defines high-cost accommodations um, uh, and low-cost accommodations and what they use is a standard based on the statewide hotel room rate and um, percentages of that so um, we'll We'll make it easy here and say um, that the statewide hotel rate is $200. I believe it's slightly less than that, but 
I'm going to use 200. And is this a uh, room right within the coastal zone? No, this is statewide, I believe. Um, oh, I believe so that you're they renting a, a room. Rate. You're renting a room in Alpine County um, uh, for seventy-two dollars, and that's actually the nicest place they have at that motel. That gets averaged in. I believe that that is what they use. They use. Uh, they look at Let's the AAA. Going. Let's keep and going. And then, and so then, low cost is seventy-five percent of that. So if it were two hundred dollars, that would be one hundred and fifty. Um, so if you're providing rooms at $150 or less, that would be low cost because it's 75% of the statewide average. And I believe it's two star hotels that they use, um, uh, for, um, establishing that rate. And then, um, they have the high cost. I believe that it's a, a percentage above that median. I believe it's over 125%. So if it were 200, again, I believe it's, it's a little bit less than that for ease of math. Where it would be two hundred and fifty dollars a night plus would be high cost, and then I don't think that they have a distinction um, uh, beyond that, right? So they don't have a luxury. You asked, do they have a luxury? And I'm not aware that they do. So, so it's high cost, low cost. Yes, and, and high cost moderate. is anything over the average, and low cost is anything under the average. Uh, no, uh, seventy-five percent of the average, 5%. and one hundred and twenty-five percent of the average is, I believe, how they look at those. So now let's go to my core question. This is the one that really I, I, I've had a hard time quantifying over the last couple of times we've heard this, and that is when you take whatever it is the Coastal Commission you know, either a moving target or a real standard or a semi-soft target or whatever it happens to be, how much, if we approve this, how much is the developer committing to low-cost visitor accommodations in all of its manifestations in this project? So um, we need to add that up, but um, they've got the 10 rooms, um, uh, the... Coastal Commission has indicated that um, they um, value uh, a single room at about one hundred and forty-four, one hundred forty-five thousand dollars each. So they've got ten rooms there. Um, they've also got the five million dollar contribution, specifically to uh, low-cost visitor serving accommodations, and then they've got fifty thousand dollars to the Santa Cruz Hostel. Um, they also have some additional things in here that um, are a little more challenging to quantify. They've got at-cost rooms for, um, uh, for nonprofit organizations, and I'll have to look and see. I believe it was 150 room nights that they offered related to that. Give me one moment, and I will confirm that. So, so um you know, there's, there's additional costs um, to them related to that. Um, yes, that's correct. 150 guest nights per year at $80 per night. Um, and then, and, and those, those are the accommodations portions, uh, as well as they've got the, uh, the family suites that, um, you know, for, um, for, with kitchenettes and uh, accommodating larger numbers of guests. Um, so I don't have dollar values on all of those, um, but that's the visitor serving accommodations. And then there are the additional things that we talked about that, um, are visitor serving, um, such as the $10,000 per year for 10 years on, um, the shuttle and, um, the, uh, they've got a range of things like the Wi-Fi and uh, bike rentals and so forth. Uh, uh, thank you. Let me ask. Mr. Petrilli, do you have a more precise answer on this question? Okay. So am I right? The Greyhound Rock is, in effect, one time $5 million. Correct. The rooms that are set aside is roughly 545000 a year. <clears throat> Does that sound right to you? Um, one hundred and forty-five. The rooms that are set aside are set aside all the time, not one time for one year. The They're ten, available all the time. The 10 rooms that you're referring uh, to? Yes, th so those would be the low cost. And there, there are 10 of those, and there are 145,000 
$145 a night, correct? Is that what you no, said? No, no. Uh, 145000 is what the Coastal Commission considers the value of a, a single low cost. So if they were paying straight in lieu fees and not providing any on site, they would have about $145,000. Um, but they are. So what's the value of that? It, you could arguably call it. 10 times 145, so 1.45 million. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So there's some almost $7 million in year number one uh, because you're making the $5 million contribution one time. Then every year thereafter, there's a million four hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of value in terms of low cost accommodations. Do I have that right? That is uh, that would be a one time if the, the in lieu would also be a one time so um you know they providing that on site uh, the one time upfront equivalent would be like 1.45 million well don't they have to provide those rooms every year they do but um uh, that value the 145k um, wouldn't be an ongoing um payment so that would be the equivalent of of them paying it up in how, how is that? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not feigning misunderstanding. Sure. I truly don't so, understand. Yeah, that. so, if so you the have value. If rooms and they're worth $145 a night times whatever, I mean, just do the arithmetic, not the math. The arithmetic is easy enough. I can follow arithmetic, so go ahead and do it. <laughs> well, I'll pull out a rough, a rough estimate Thank you. on a uh, calculator here. If you wanted to do an annual amount, um, uh, they have indicated the rooms would be about um, uh, uh, about three hundred and thirty dollars a night if they did um, three hundred and thirty um, minus um, let's for sake of argument say it is one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, I think it's actually a little bit less than that, but one hundred and fifty dollars um, a night means that they would be losing about one hundred and eighty dollars a night on those, and you multiply that by all the room nights. Three thousand five hundred and sixty um, is um, six hundred and forty thousand eight hundred in year one. For that, and am I right? Every year thereafter. Every year thereafter. That's so correct. So there's an ongoing six hundred forty thousand dollar year commitment to on-site affordable housing. There's a one-time five million dollar to Greyhound Rock to turn that into some kind of low-cost visitor accommodating camping opportunity. Am I okay so far? Yes. Okay. Anything else goes into this bucket that there, that we call low-cost visitor accommodations? Um, for accommodations, they do have the um, 150 guest nights per year at um, $80 per night. So we can do that calculation as well. Um, 330 minus 80 is going to put you at 250 times 150 is uh, $37,500 a year. So another 40, so this is now $680,000 a year, every year, for low-cost visitor accommodations, okay, plus $5 million to Greyhound, okay. All right. Uh, all, all in service of a of a target uh, that doesn't seem entirely clear. Uh, there is no standard or target that this hotel versus the next one that comes along uh, are trying to hit. I'm 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 having a hard time. Here, here's what I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Butler, and it's, I'm not just goofing around by asking these questions. I'm trying to figure out is this. I have no issue. In fact, yesterday, Cal Matters ran an op-ed that I authored in cooperation with the Coastal Commission about how I don't believe there's a conflict between the state's efforts to build more housing and the existing Coastal Act. I think those are, can work together. So I am not, a, I'm not uh, one of these Coastal Commission bashers. I, uh, when the Coastal Commission was in our community recently, I welcomed them here. I gave a bit of a presentation on my understanding, my involvement in the Coastal Act over the last four decades. I am a 
big supporter of the Coastal Act. I think socializing the coast of California was one of the most important acts ever taken in this country in terms of coastal protection. So I'm a big supporter of the Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission. What I'm not a supporter of is vague, flexible goals that don't let a project have an understanding of when they've met them and when they haven't. And so if we're going to be amending this, and this is going to solve the Coastal Commission's problem, great. If we're going to approve this and it goes to the Coastal Commission and they still have, whether at the staff level or the commissioner level, some one or more new thoughts about this, uh, I am not clear on why we should do this then today. If, if, the, if this does not settle the issue, and it sounds to me like this does not settle the issue, this merely is our next supplicant on bended knee effort to get the Coastal Commission to approve a project not on the beach, not within sight of the ocean, <clears throat> where all kinds of, of concessions have been made on a project that can generate millions of dollars for general fund purposes in our city, what the heck are we supposed to think if we take this action as recommended? Is the issue settled? And is the standard achieved? And I'll bet you your very thoughtful self, the way you always are with us, will say it may. That's correct, Mayor. <laughs> That's what I, what I thought. Are there other questions or comments? Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Council Member Bruner is disqualified. Council Member Kellentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes. It's so ordered. We are on item 40. This is. Uh, On item 41, this is the City Council consideration of a sugar sweetened beverage uh, tax, and uh, we will open this with a presentation by our colleagues, Ms. Watkins, Ms. Bruner, and Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Ms. Watkins, you are recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I know um, Councilmember Bruner is coming. Coming back. Do you mind if I go check to you see? You do what you okay. want. Okay. It's all oh, good. Thank you. In fact, if we could take a five minute recess, we're going to recess for five minutes. Thank you.
Did I hit the target? I tried to explode. Did I hit the target? What? It's all good. It's all good. Here we go. <coughs> Council. <coughs> Do you some Do it. There we go. The Santa Cruz City Council is now back in session following a brief afternoon recess. We are on item 41. This is a council consideration of a ballot measure regarding sugar sweetened beverages as a presentation from the ad hoc committee on that topic and I will recognize 
Council Member Watkins to open this item. Thank Council you. Member. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's my pleasure to open this item on behalf of, of myself, my colleagues, Council Member Bruner and Kalantari Johnson, and um, all of the city staff and community partners who have gotten us to this place. As you know, we had a um, ad hoc committee form to explore a sugar sweetened beverage tax, and we have a proposal before you today. So next slide, please. So I'm just gonna go over a little bit of uh, the background of where we've been and where we are and where we hope to go. So one thing to keep in mind is that this is not something we created or invented, that other communities across the globe have implemented these types of taxes and have found success in reinvesting those dollars into health and wellness as well as decreasing um, use of, of sugar sweetened beverages. I think Councilmember Brown is um, the only one who was on the council with me, although I know some staff was also involved. But in 2018, we were planning to bring this item to our voters. Um, unfortunately, what we saw was the industry basically strong arming our legislation, our legislators, to pass the Keep Groceries Affordable Act, which essentially stopped our ability to move forward without major penalty. And um, myself and others have been involved in challenging that penalty provision, and we were successful, thankfully, because we disagree with the law, and it's unconstitutional. And one of the things that I love about being in local government is our ability to design policies for our local community. And that is part of the, U the, the California State Constitution to allow charter cities to do that. And this undermined our ability to do that. And now with that gone, we are able to pursue this at this time. So that brings us to our current status. And after a number of months of work, a uh, lot of conversations and discussions, we've landed in a place to bring a full proposal to uh, you all, our colleagues on the council, as well as our community. Next slide, please. I don't think I need to say much uh, about this slide. I think it really truly speaks for itself. Um, what you'll see here is essentially the equivalent of the amounts of sugar in each of these beverages and um, how exorbitant really it is and how harmful that is to uh, a number of individuals and we'll talk a little bit about some of the health impacts as we proceed with the presentation. I'll pass it on to Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Great, thank you so much. Um, so my work on this issue actually started oh nearly 20 years ago if you can believe it when I was uh, heading up a a coalition here in Santa Cruz County to address childhood obesity. Our rates were astronomical and um, much higher than other communities across the state, um, and in particular uh, among our Latino community members and um, Latino children. So here we are, almost 20 years later, and what we know now is a lot more than what we knew then, and what we knew then was quite a bit as well. Um, there's a lot of research. There was some of that in your packet. Um, some of it is what we're highlighting here this afternoon uh, about the impacts of sugar-sweetened beverages on members of our community. Um, we know that sugar-sweetened beverages is a number one source of added sugar in the American diet. Uh, we know that it, it causes um, dental disease, it causes diabetes, obesity, heart disease, among many others. Um, I'm not going to read again. I'm not going to read all of these statistics. They're pretty compelling. Um, I will point out the one that touches me because I have a 14-year-old and 16-year-old at home. That two in three California teenagers drink at least one soda soda beverage daily. Um, that's tremendous. And. I don't know, maybe my teens are sneaking it behind my back. I hope that they're not drinking that every day. Um, but it has an impact. And if we can go to the next slide, um, it has an impact in our local community. Uh, as I said, 20 years ago, our numbers were astronomical. We did some great work. We saw the numbers decline. And now we're seeing them go back up. 
So um, I think the time is right, given the context that Councilmember Watkins just gave, um, and what we're seeing from our medical community and so many others in the public health field, that there's data that shows that we have, again, more overweight children here in California, um, excuse me, here in Santa Cruz compared to other, uh, compared to California average, and that our adult obesity is highest among Latino. And, and we have a quote here from um, our Dominican hospital community needs assessment showing that trend going in the wrong direction. So if we could go to the next slide. Okay. Sorry, my slides are catching up. Um, okay, so the other thing we know, before I go into what's on this slide, is that, that um, the, public, the public health world, again, has done quite a bit of research on this. And the best practice is to shift policies that will shift environment so that the healthy choice is the easiest choice. We've seen this um, around other issues. We've seen this around alcohol consumption. We've seen this in tobacco. And the public health se sector is, is set out to do the work. And so we've seen some results in a very short amount of time, and that's what you see here, is that um, other communities, such as Berkeley and San Francisco, who've passed these taxes, have seen a shift in behavior of a decrease in um, soda consumption and an increase in water consumption. That's the direction we want to go, which ultimately impacts all of those health issues, the chronic diseases and um, dental uh, diseases that I just mentioned. Um, there was also a study done by UC Berkeley across um, the United States, and let me see. Um, I think it was across five, yes, across five cities they found a 33% um, decline in soda purchases. So, you know, we again, we're not just doing this in a vacuum. There are other communities here, our neighbors who have done it, who have seen the impacts, and we're hopeful that should the council approve this today, should it pass by the voters, that we will be able to follow the same trends. I'm just going to read one quote that really stood out to me from this study. Um, it's not on the slide. I'm going to read it to you, and it's from um, someone who worked on the study. We need to show the investment side of the sugar-sweetened beverage taxes and that these monies, in fact, do go back into community in ways that make a difference. We need to show how the infrastructure that makes investments is responsive to community needs, that these funds are building infrastructure, and that the drop in consumption of sugary drinks is not just because poor folks can't afford it, but rather because the education efforts and making the healthy choice, the easy choice, are being driven through investments. Um, we have a short clip that we're going to show you um, that demonstrates this, demonstrates that the investments going back into the community. And Bonnie's going to show that. Very good. later or skip it if it's not coming up. Okay. Well, we'll provide the link. It's a great clip that shows um, how Berkeley is reinvesting their dollars into community programs that improve health and well-being. So we'll get, we'll get that to you all and um, maybe include it in the, in the minutes for the community. I'll pass it on to Councilmember Bruner. I can continue. Thank you, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Um, and I will just add on that... Um, uh, it looks like the video, you let me know um, if it's ready and I can pause. Okay. Right, well, I'll continue. Um, in addition to the local or California state, there is a lot of data that I encourage um, everyone to look at in the National Health Institute data. I mean, 45 countries have implemented sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. It's, it's pretty amazing. The, the years of um, outcomes that in the data associated with that, that's available 
So what we focused on is um, our community here in Santa Cruz. And this is not, we're not here today to pass a tax. We're here today to decide if a sugar sweetened beverage tax um, should be placed on the November ballot. And um, so we did some initial polling and um, to inquire random uh, voters in the city of Santa Cruz um, and assess their support for uses of the funding. And you know, with research showing that sugary drinks are the largest contributors of added sugars, um, we found support in various programs and initiatives um, and it was quite fitting that our Parks and Rec Department was here earlier uh, to start the meeting, highlighting some of the benefits of programs that promote mental health, physical and social economic wellness, um, emotional well-being, and our natural resources, community development. So. Um, the support is there. There's um, a graph there. Next slide, please. And in addition to that, we did um, a, a lot of engagement, stakeholder outreach um, to decide um, input and assess whether this should be something to be placed on the November ballot. Um, we. Uh, conducted outreach over the past year and um, as you see here there were different sectors of groups we met with and spoke with and that included the American Heart Association, the Santa Cruz Chamber of Commerce, Seaside Company, our Santa Cruz County Office of Education, our County Health Department, United Way of Santa Cruz as well as other leaders in healthcare, dental, medical industry, small business, gather, to gather input about placing this tax measure on the ballot. In addition, some of these um, um, engagement meetings shared with us um, um, some of the work in the other cities uh, nearby in the Bay Area, and there were some case studies that Council Member Kalantari Johnson uh, referenced, and so we received a lot of engagement um, from that as well and information um, on some of the, the statewide work. Thank you. And then I would like to pass it on to um, our city attorney's office, Cassie Bronson, to speak about some of the ballot language and details. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, the subcommittee asked me to go through a few of the nitty gritty details here of what's on the resolution. So I'll just uh, take the council through that briefly. Um, what's in the resolution before you is a two cents per fluid ounce tax on the distribution of sugar sweetened beverages uh, within the city of Santa Cruz. And um, the point of distribution is uh, that basically the tax is applied to the first point of wholesale distribution in the city of Santa Cruz. And it's the distributors of the sugar sweetened beverages who would be the ones actually paying the tax to the city. Uh, and that tax can only be applied one time. So it's not applying um, at that point inside the grocery store to the consumer. It's um, a step before that um, on the wholesale distribution. The administration of the tax is anticipated to be fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, the process of tracking, collecting, and remitting the tax was modeled after the city of Berkeley. Uh, we anticipate that distributors would use an online form uh, to track and report the taxable ounces of sugar-sweetened beverages. And businesses already utilize um, an online tax portal for the purpose of remitting other taxes. Um, Question about the impact to consumers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the tax is not applied directly to consumers, but it is anticipated that retailers would pass on that cost uh, uh, to consumers uh, to make uh, sugar sweetened beverages potentially more expensive and encouraging healthier choices. Uh, we, there's, a uh, there's a registration requirement written within the resolution, so distributors would need to register with the city. 
and uh, distributors would be required to start collecting the tax on May 1st, 2025. And if we could go to the next slide, please, Bonnie. And uh, the exemptions are also really important to discuss today. Uh, the proposal before you has a small business exemption. So um, when the sugar sweetened beverage go is purchased by a small, a small business in the city, uh, that transaction is not taxed. So in a small business is a business with less than $500,000 in gross receipts in the most recent calendar year. Um, and the other types of exemptions that are important to understand is the products that are exempted. A number of products are uh, low calorie beverages are exempted, baby formula, beverages for medical use, meal replacement beverages, milk products, 100% fruit juice, um, and sweetened medication are some examples. Uh, the subcommittee also is important for them to uh, have a community oversight panel in the proposal that's before you, um, and so that's in section 3.38015. Uh, so the revenue generated by this tax is for general fund purposes, uh, but the resolution also contemplates an oversight committee to generate recommendations on how that money would be spent, and that would be a seven-member oversight panel, and there's some direction within the resolution as to the composition of that panel. And those are all the details for me. Thanks. Great. I'll take it back from here. And um, I think I don't need to really say more other than what has already been said, but this sort of summarizes that the economic impact to the city is 1.3 million annually. And um, what those investments could be and what our community is saying that they hope they are, are to have that those dollars reinvested into the parks and facilities to be accessible and safe, to think about how we're investing in programs for children and youth, maintaining active recreation programs and facilities for seniors, children, and people of all ages, to name just a few. Um, and as Cassie mentioned, how it's designed is to uh, be simple and straightforward in terms of the collection of tax, but also not to um, in, you know, indirectly harm some of our smaller businesses with the exemption. And um, we feel we did our best to really come up with a comprehensive proposal that meets sort of our unique Santa Cruz community needs. Um, and I will say with the economic impact, we have had success in showing that with these types of measures and with these types of uh, processes with the seven member advisory body, you really do have uh, voices to help inform decision making as was demonstrated at our last meeting with the dedicated children's fund from the cannabis tax dollars next slide please okay so i will just wrap up by uh closing here and you have these great cute faces um so what i'll just say is um a couple things not only have we heard why it's good for our community why it's good for public health but it's also, one thing I, I want to also highlight is that similar to big tobacco and big oil and, and now big soda, we, we truly don't want special interest groups pushing profits over people. And that's essentially what the state legislation did, is it let the special interests drive what our communities could do and how we can make these decisions and have our, uh, our, our constituencies weigh in. And so when, um, when we're thinking about that, I think what we have to remember is that at the local level, we have an opportunity now to put this back to the people, to, to reinstate the power to the people, and by placing this on the ballot allows us to do that in, in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'll just also end, for me, I was reading one of the statistics that was shared by the American Heart Association um, and that high sugary beverages consumption associated to weight gain and increased chronic disease um, is estimated that 50,000 deaths are associated to those consumptions of, of beverages and that 40,000 are attributed to type 2 diabetes. 
And I'll just share briefly that I lost my grandmother prematurely to diabetes. Um, I have a cousin who's currently waiting to have two transplants associated with diabetes. So I, our family is one of those statistics, like many families, and so it's not only the right thing to do for our community, it's also a real personal um, experience in, in our family's lives as well. So I'll end with that and uh, pass it over to Council Member Bruner for our recommendation. Thank you. Um, so today's action would let the City of Santa Cruz voters decide on the November ballot whether to support community health initiatives with revenues from a distributor tax on sugar sweetened beverages and um, our recommendation we're calling it a potential measure for a healthier Santa Cruz um, and the motion is to accept the recommendation from the City Council Sugar Sweetened Beverage Ad Hoc Committee and two, to adopt an, at a resolution requesting that the November 5th, 2024 general election ballot include a general tax of two cents per fluid ounce on distributors of sugar sweetened beverages. That includes a community oversight panel to transmit an annual report and make res recommendations to the City Council and three, to support the measure for the purpose of authorizing arguments, directing the mayor to designate up to three council members to identify authors and signers of arguments in favor of this measure, working with members of the community if they so choose, directing the city attorney to prepare the impartial analysis and providing direction to the city manager, the preparation of the fiscal analysis as appropriate. If passed, a campaign would be established between now and November to have education, outreach, and engagement on um, a healthier Santa Cruz. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Sure, I'll second that. Second by... <laughs> and we get to go to public comment. <laughs> second by Council Member Watkins. This will be the opportunity for anyone who wishes to address us on this matter and do so at this time. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. I'm, I'm Catherine Forrest, Dr. Catherine Forrest. I'm a board-certified family physician um, and also a public health specialist with degrees from UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco. And I'm here in strong support of putting this on the ballot. I did send the Berkeley study to each of you to take a look at, but I did want to highlight, in addition, when I first came to Santa Cruz, I was the medical director of the then Santa Cruz Women's Health Center, and I worked at the county for many years. Um, then I went to UCSC, and then I went back to teach and trying to get more people into family medicine. But I wanted to point out that when we first opened pediatrics at the Women's Health Center in 1997, we never saw childhood diabetes. And we, the rate of childhood diabetes has gone skyrocketing. We didn't see gestational diabetes as frequently as we see it now, and it has gone skyrocketing. And one of the main components of that is sugar-sweetened beverages, because we know it is the number one source of added simple sugars in our diets. So I've been a part of a national campaign to address this very issue. I wanted to commend the um, council members for looking to the data to show why taxation works, and it does. Um, there's a study at UC Berkeley that you, know, you um, are acquainted with, but the study at UCSF the previous year showed a 44% decrease in gestational diabetes. If you want to see results now in the city, do something now in the city. And um, I recently was thinking a little bit about teaching. I teach at UC San Francisco's residency in Salinas at Natividad. And we now regularly teach residents about managing childhood diabetes by stopping sugar sweetened beverages. It's a number one, the keystone to treatment in the, in the population. And I was thinking about a case we recently had of a family from grandparent down to parent, gestational diabetes, down to a nine-year-old with diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes. It's not theoretical. It's data that you can construct. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you place this on the ballot. Also so that our, our constituents are, uh, your constituents are educated about the importance as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone online? We'll take the next person online, and then we'll be right with you in a moment. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting.
Hello, is this, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, council members and mayor. My name is Lalise Ramirez. I am the director of field programs for In Advance, and I've been working with multiple jurisdictions to consider placing sugar sweetened beverage distributor ballot measures on the upcoming November ballot. Um, this afternoon, I'm actually also speaking to you as an immigrant, a female, a daughter whose father has type 2 diabetes, and most recently, a mother of two. Um, I can echo the same reasons why you should vote to place this measure on the ballot, but I also want to mention what we are up against. Um, the, beverage, the beverage industry has vehemently opposed any SSB tax policy, and they will continue to do so. I have been working on SSB tax policy since 2014. I was in the 2014 Berkeley versus Big Soda, the 2016 Oakland and San Francisco and Albany soda tax measures, and I am very well aware of their tactics. The private conversations, promises of political alliances and support, even the promise of building local gyms and community pools. But the impact of their products goes beyond these offerings. They heavy market their product. They secure endorsements of high profile social artists. Up until a few years ago, they sponsored the halftime show of the most viewed sports event in this country. Their product placement at stores is all intentional to get us hooked on sugar and it is their sugar. Several weeks ago, I was on the phone with a Teamster member of the very membership who opposed all soda tax measures. The conversations were, was good regarding strong membership and support for their work. That is until I mentioned my work on soda tax policies or SSB policies. And at that point, the conversation changed to how members have, got, have been forgotten and jobs had been lost. All, are, all of these are all lies and tactics of the industry. In 2018, this industry blackmailed legislators into banning local SSB taxes. They took away the people's right to democracy, the right to vote on this matter. And I ask you to support your local community, give your local voters the opportunity to consider this measure and stand up to this industry. Do it for those of us here today and ask for your support to move this forward, but also do it for all future generations to come. Please show them here that there are local investments to support healthy and active living in their community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, council members. And um, first I wanna acknowledge and really appreciate the fact that you have worked to incorporate health in all policies in the decisions that you make, and I think this is really reflective um, of that going forward. I also want to thank Councilmember Watkins. I want to thank Cal Councilmember Kalantari Johnson and Councilmember Bruner, who's really spearheaded this movement and work. And it's a lot of work. You have a, you know, a big pile on your desk of important matters that people really are concerned about in your city. Um, we are also concerned about your city. Deanthes, I think I told, my, told you who I was, right? Yeah. Okay, Laura Marcus, the yeah. CEO of Dianthus Community Dental Care. And Dianthus has been serving this community for over 30 years. Um, Santa Cruz City alone, we provide services to about 4,000 individuals here. Um, we have a clinic over in Harvey West, and we also provide on-site services at the Coral Street campus for people experiencing homelessness. We have two other clinics in the community and serve 16,000 people countywide. But unfortunately, um, that's not enough. Uh, there's 90,000 people in our community. One third of Santa Cruz County um, is on our public medical program. Only one of three can access dental services because there's no, no way to access them. There's no providers taking medical insurance except public health clinics like ours and Salud Parlante. And ultimately, what we're seeing every day is this really significant uh, impact, especially on young children, but on elders as well. In fact, one in four adults across our country have lost all their teeth by the time they're age 60. Um, one of my board members, a recent board member, uh, um, shared a story about the fact that when he was growing up in Mexico, his and he's a pa current patient of Dianthus, his family always chose Coca-Cola over any other type of beverage, and that because of that, he feels was the reason that by the age, he was 40, age of 42, he'd lost all his teeth. 
Um, dentures are no joke. They're not a fun appliance to wear. It is not easy to eat with them. They cause ulcers and sores in your mouth. And he's now 72. And so imagine for 30 years of your life having to be in the uncomfortable position of no teeth or dentures. Um, obviously, sugar-sweetened beverages and this tax could impact uh, the results and impacts of children, or I should say outcomes of children in our community, and eventually the seniors in our community, right? Uh, another example is one of the young children that we serve, um, who's now 10, recently got in her um, adult front teeth, four front teeth, uppers and lowers, and that was after six years of having no front teeth, because at age two, well, so I guess that's eight years, at age two she'd had her two, oh, did I run out of time already? Okay, I will close up then, but I did send an email, and I included pictures, and I hope you will recognize the value in this measure. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we have someone online, so we'll be right with you, sir. Thank you for your forbearance. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon. My name is Blythe Young. I'm the community advocacy director for the American Heart Association. Um, Combined with my prior roles at other organizations, I have been working on local soda taxes for the last 10 years. The Heart Association actively supports sugary drink taxes because sugary drinks are making us sick. And sugary drinks taxes are effective in reducing consumption and resulting health harms. Like many people, my family has been impacted by the harms of sugary drinks and type 2 diabetes. 25 years ago, my grandmother chose to discontinue dialysis and end her life. She still wanted a Coca-Cola. My dad, her son, is also a type 2 diabetic. This puts him at higher risk for heart attack and stroke as diabetes is one of the leading contributing factors for heart attack. I've spent my entire life learning about nutrition to try to help both my family and other people from entering into this. I have taught high school students about um, how much the American beverage industry spends billions of dollars a year to advertise with celebrities. I'm sure we have all seen the Super Bowl ads Almost two thirds of children and half of adults consume sugary beverages every day. On average, children consume 30 gallons every year. That's enough to fill a bathtub. That concerns us because it's estimated that over 50,000 deaths are associated with high sugary beverages consumed each year. The allocation of the proposed sugary drink tax revenue is critical to its standing as a progressive tax and should be used to fund public health prevention efforts. This includes both active living and healthy eating. We can't outrun a bad diet. Santa Cruz was poised to go for a tax when the state preemption occurred as a result of the lobbying of the beverage industry in a backdoor deal in 2018. We are looking forward to see Santa Cruz succeed in passing and putting a measure on the ballot to join the cities of Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, and Albany in generating vital funds for public health. You have a strong coalition of supporters, local and statewide, standing behind you, ready to help. Let the city of Santa Cruz show their support for this vital public health measure and let the people decide if they would like this revenue to come to the city. Many cities are facing a deficit in their funds and these funds can go to help a long way and ensure that the residents of Santa Cruz can live long and healthy lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Welcome, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, my name is Kevin Norton. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, this is really wonderful. I have goosebumps because I'm so inspired and everyone is speaking my language. Um, I like um, what you're saying, Martine, about connecting this to bigger issues of special interest affecting our health. For example, the fossil fuel industry knew in the 1950s that they were causing global warming, but instead funded, funded research to confuse the public, and that confusion continues today. The soda industry does the same thing. They are funding research to make people think that the reason for our chronic disease epidemic is a lack of exercise. <clears throat> So if anyone thinks that soda is harmless, please talk to me. I can tell you all about the tobacco playbook that the soda industry is using to delay the inevitable. But eventually, taxes will be on soda nationwide because we're on an unsustainable path. So I'd like to tell you a joke 
Um, and here it is. Nine out of 10 doctors recommend that children do not drink soda. Do you know who the 10th doctor is? Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you get an extra 10 cents. <laughs> so the soda industry has a talking point that this is a, a tax on the poor, but the real tax is getting a chronic health condition as a result of drinking soda, one that was preventable. So diabetics in the U.S. now spend $6,000 a year on insulin. More than half a million Americans go into bankruptcy each year because of medical debt, which doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And Americans carry $220 billion in medical debt. <clears throat> These are the horrific financial consequences of, uh, consequences of soda consumption, not to mention the premature deaths, the emotional and physical suffering. And the, the truth is that shopkeepers make more money from selling bottled water or just about anything else besides soda because the profit margin is so low. I wanted to talk about a long and tragic story about my uncle who was a victim of our toxic food system, but I won't get into it. I do wish that he could be around to spend time with his grandchildren. To summarize, we have a tax that will prevent deaths, be good for the economy, and there's a lot more that I can say about how a healthier population is good for economy. And it will allow more grandparents to spend time with their grandchildren. Thank you for your hard work and your courage. I'm grateful to say that I was a witness today, and I hope that the council will move forward with this tax. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon, and welcome to the council meeting. Thank you, council members. Tim James, California Grocers Association. We have significant concerns with moving forward with the measure at this time today. It needs to be made clear that this is a direct tax on grocery stores. It is not a tax placed on the described product or paid by consumers. This tax measure will increase the cost to operate in the grocery store as it has in all other communities with similar uh, regulation. Passing this measure will raise the price of groceries for all consumers. The committee performed outreach to a number of stakeholders except Santa Cruz grocers. We have confirmed this with the grocers themselves. If you have engaged grocers, councils and the public's understanding of this tax would be significantly changed. Admitting grocers deserves a correction, just as if any other key constituency was unseen and left out. We request the measure not move forward until a meeting with the committee and impacted grocers occurs to ensure inclusive consideration. As presented, the Keep Grocers Affordable Act and its impact on the measure is incomplete. The act prevents cities from imposing new taxes of this type. The preemption on local agencies passing these types of taxes still remains. Placing this tax on the ballot knowingly defies state law is making promises that cannot be guaranteed. Not recognizing this enormously critical legal situation in advance borders on being irresponsible. We request the measure not move forward until the public stakeholders and the council are fully aware this measure would violate state law. We believe and hope the council agrees that public policy is best served with an inclusive and straightforward process, even when disagreements may arise. If you believe in this principle as well, these significant omissions must be remedied before moving forward. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for calling in. Anyone else, uh, Ms. Bush online? We'll take that next person online. Good afternoon, person online. Welcome to the council meeting. Um. Hello, this is Melanie Wong. Um, I am here today representing the, Net, the Nutrition and Fitness Collaborative of the Central Coast, which represents nearly 100 public health and community agencies in Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties. And we have been active in supporting sugar sweetened beverage taxes for more than 10 years and actually did seminal research here on the Central Coast of who was actually drinking sugar sweetened beverages that were used for some of the measures that had been introduced to the legislature very early on. Um, so I am a veteran of this process. I'm here today to speak in strong support that you put this on your ballot 
but I also want to speak to the racial equity issues that are involved here. Um, as your um, as as was shown, who is it that drinks sugar sweetened beverages, and who are the consumers that will ultimately be the ones bearing the cost of this? These are lower income and BIPOC, and that therefore that makes it a regressive tax. Um, I do know that you are doing this as a general fund measure and that you have an oversight panel. I urge you, the devil's in the details, that that oversight panel be very, as much as they can, put barriers and barricades and directions around how these funds are used, that it should be directed to the communities that are actually paying for it. Um, we have, I'm also here speaking as the head of the California Food Policy Council. We have 30 councils across the state. Um, and we have heard from other parts of the state that have tried to do this. And there's continued to be pushback from BIPOC communities. They're saying, we're, we're, you're taking the money from us and we're not gonna see any of it. So I wanted to give you that feedback. Um, again, I speak in support of this. I think this is the right thing to do as a public health professional. And um, we urge you to adopt this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon and welcome to the council meeting. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dalila Alvarado, and I am also a member of the Nutrition Fitness Collaborative of the Central Coast. I'd like to also echo all of um, what my colleague Melanie Wong just shared, and really just in support of the implementation of the sugar sweetened beverage tax in Santa Cruz. As was previously mentioned, excessive consumption of sugary drinks is directly linked to serious and lifelong health issues such as obesity, the rates of diabetes. I know in Monterey County, um, about 50% of the adult population has prediabetes or already has diabetes type 2 and also heart disease. In addition, there's a statistic that mentions that those born after the year 2000 have a 50% chance of developing diabetes type 2 in their lifetime. So we're looking at this, um, you know, diabetes issue with um, all our youth, um, which is very concerning as diabetes is a lifelong uh, issue. Like mentioned earlier, um, you know, the revenue from this tax can really be used to promote nutrition education programs in schools, also do things like improving community infrastructure like parks and, you know, uh, promoting that natural movement as well as gardens. The tax also demonstrates a strong and brave stance against big soda because, uh, you know, the sugar sweetened beverage industry has aggressive marketing tactics that often target our vulnerable, vulnerable populations, largely those who are uh, minorities, low income and children. So this results in those communities largely, um, you know, having disproportionately uh, rates of diabetes type 2 and those other health conditions. Implementing a sugar sweetened beverage tax in Santa Cruz is a proactive step towards promoting public health, reducing health care costs, and addressing the root causes of chronic disease. So once again, um, I, I urge Santa Cruz to implement this um, in the ballot and hope that it passes and serves as a guide for other uh, California cities. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No one else online. Anyone else wish to provide testimony? Matters back before the body. Council Member Watkins is recognized. I'm happy to um, move the recommendation as presented. There's a motion. Is there uh, a second by Council Member Bruner and a third by Council Member Colantar Johnson on the rare third that we offer here? <laughs> uh, you may open on your measure, on your motion rather. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, w I won't say much more. I just want to thank those who came in person as well as called in um, just expressing their opinions and um, most in support of us being able to bring this to the voters in November, uh, not only for the obvious economic impact, but certainly more importantly for the um, health impacts that we foresee as an outcome. I just want to briefly say I know that there were comments about the um, state law. Well, I'll just say as the plaintiff, I believe that's unconstitutional. And we won in the penalty provision and we believe we will win again. So um, that just sort of summarizes my position on that. And I know that a number of folks have been tracking that as well. 
So with that, um, it's my absolute pleasure to um, bring this forward, make the motion, and hopefully um, start the conversation in our community and see success in November. For the debate or discussion, the vice mayor's record. I just have one question for either Cassie or Tony. Um, is there anticipated legal costs if this was to go to the ballot? And if so, what do you expect that that could possibly be? Okay. So, yeah, um, to address that question, and also I believe there was a comment from the California Grocers Association and also some of Councilmember Watkins' comments. So, to just kind of clarify this issue, you know, it is true that the court in the Cult of Alas Salud case, which Councilmember Watkins addressed earlier, they only addressed the legality of the Keep Grocery Affordable Acts penalty provision, and that court did not address the threshold question of whether or not uh, state law preempts charter cities like the city of Santa Cruz uh, from enacting local taxes on groceries, including sugar sweetened beverages. So in light of that ambiguity, you know, it is anticipated that there could be a legal action against the city uh, if this matter were to uh, be passed by the voters. Um, with that said, uh, a number of cases have upheld a charter city's right to tax in a variety of different circumstances. I can rattle off a number of case names, um, Ex Parte Braun and Ray Galusha, City of Los Angeles versus AEC of Los Angeles, uh, Weeks versus City of Oakland, Fisher, Fisher versus County of Alameda. And uh, there's a 2019 Supreme Court case called City and County of San Francisco versus Regents of the University of California um, which sort of summed up and said that the Home Rule Authority includes the power to tax for local purposes and that the power to tax is the lifeblood of the charter city. So there is a law that would um, support the city's position. I could not guarantee success in that type of legal action, but it is anticipated that there could be a legal action against the city. So despite, um, you know, us bringing this, supporting this today, there could be potential legal cost to the city. Even despite that, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing this forward. I think even the legal risk or the potential cost to the city, um, I think the benefit far outweighs the potential impact or cost. Um, a couple of things that weren't mentioned that it's this sort of another personal aside is my husband had to have hernia surgery from lifting an obese patient as a firefighter paramedic. And so costs to cities in terms of um, workers' comp costs and things like that when dealing with people with things that could potentially be preventable. I read in the study um, or some of the paperwork that you sent over that when it passed in Berkeley, some people said they went to Alameda or Oakland or something or San Francisco to purchase their beverages because of the tax. Everyone knows I drink Pepsi. <laughs> I probably would not drive to Scotts Valley to save 25 cents on a case of Pepsi. But um, what I do think that it would do would, if I was at a fast food place ordering something and the choice was a little bit more per ounce, I would probably order the smaller size. And I think it would change my behavior over time, to be quite honest. And I think that's a good thing because I've, We've watched over the years the portions in these beverages go up um, exponentially, and we can see um, in, I think, for the first time in generations, our life expectancy is actually lower now than it was, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. So I know it's an uphill battle. I appreciate your work on this, and I will be supporting you guys despite the potential risks and costs to the city. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. I'll make a couple of quick comments. Um, I, I want to appreciate the Health and All Policies Committee for and, and staff for uh, working uh, really, really diligently and 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 deeply to get us to this point. Um, what are we at six six years later? Um, and I, yes, I was there. <laughs> I remember. Um, and I'm so I'm, I'm really glad to see that we're. Um, we're at the place where we can take this action. Um, I want to particularly thank Council Member Watkins. I mean, if I'm going to read a quote from our our agenda report here, um, in case folks wonder what your council members are doing when they're when they're not here at the dais or um, you know working 
on some specific city agenda items. Um, there's a whole lot that goes on, and I just want to say, in 2018, Fresno-based nonprofit Cultiva La Salud and Council Member Martin Watkins sued the state of California. <laughs> right? So think about that. Um, you know, I just threw up my hands and said, "Oh, we didn't get that one." That you know, the, here the you know corporate interests, um, the beverage industry, it ha you know, is going to maintain its control. They've captured the legislature. I threw up my hands. Council Member Watkins went to work. <laughs> and um, so I, I really think that, you know, the, this is what we see when um, we have a leader who is committed to, um, you know, responding to the public health crisis. I don't see this as a revenue measure. I see this as tax policy to address a public health crisis. And um, if that revenue, that figure goes down over time, then we are, that's success. So um, thank you, and I'm very pleased to uh, also be voting yes on the motion. For the comment, council members. <laughs> thank you, Mary Kay. Yes, I uh, just want to uh, thank uh, council member Watkins and council member Bruner and council member Kalantari Johnson uh, for all the work on this, on this, uh, uh, on this agenda item and for uh, all the data that you provided to us as well to actually make an informed decision on putting this on uh, the ballot. Uh, I too uh, have had my family impacted too by diabetes and overconsumption of sugar and uh, you know, happy to support this ballot measure. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Questions, comments? Um, if I might ask a couple, uh, I suspect like other members I've been contact by what is called the industry uh, on this question. They raised a couple of issues, and one is that question of whether this is settled law or not. That's to be decided, apparently. Uh, so, you know, but I do think that when we put a measure, this measure on the ballot, I, I have a couple of conceptual uh, notions to try to deal with in my own mind. Uh, one of them is do we believe, do the authors of this believe, I have reason to believe, that with this tax itself, that that will either be a discouragement and change consumer behavior and or that the funds raised by this money can be utilized in such a way that behavior will be changed? Presumably what you're trying to do here is reduce consumption. And so you have reason to believe that one or both of those strategies will reduce will result in reduced consumption. Yes. Beyond the city of Berkeley, which was referenced in here, we have other reason to believe that. Yes. So whichever one of you would like to address that, that'd be helpful. I'll just say um, there are several case studies with at least three years of data from other cities that have implemented a sugar sweetened beverage tax and data showing the outcomes of how they invested the money in nutrition programs, health programs, education programs, partnering with local nonprofits and communities. Um, and they've, the data speaks for itself. And I also briefly mentioned earlier, we can look outside Santa Cruz in California. There are 45 countries, I think uh, is what I said, that have implemented this, and they have health um, outcomes um, that show positive impacts. And furthermore, the National Health Institute has data. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing, and and that's how we base our our confidence that to answer your question, yes. Okay. I mean, it does may seem, I may? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, Just to add to that, I haven't had an opportunity to read um, what Dr. Catherine um, referenced and sent us, uh, but she also referenced a, a data that's very close to us at UCSF. So I'm looking forward to reading that report. Let me ask you about that. This is really interesting to me. I, I won't belabor the point, but I would like to explore the point. Those are different. Um, because in our, the ballot measure here, it says, uh, to sustain vital city services, such as improving and maintaining neighborhood parks, beaches, open space, and providing safe routes to school, and a whole number of other things. Are those the kinds of expenditures that 
result in a reduction in the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages? Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for calling me back. The person who should be here is my late husband, Will Forrest, who is the epidemiologist for the County of Santa Cruz, um, however, <laughs> in his wake. Um, the data actually is really focused on the tax effect on consumption rather than the expenditures because it's hard to study long-term effects. So one of the reasons I brought up the diabetes, gestational diabetes one, is because it's very recent and immediate. But in long-term studies looking at taxes and how spending taxes on things that improve activity in communities, the data is solid. The public health data is solid. So if we spend whatever revenues we get, and I hope you're right that they do decrease over time, that is a success. But if the, rev the revenues that we have are spent on um, activities, things that, that are encourage activities or healthy a healthier food consumption, there's plenty of data to support that. And, and what, what kind of program spending does make that causal connection and result in lower incidence of diabetes or reduction in the consumption of the sugary sweetened beverages? What, um, what kind I, of expenditures help make that happen? I think that the, the, the biggest, the well best known one looks at whether or not there's walkable streets and public um, transportation, things that get people out of cars and that encourage other kinds of activities. For instance, the data on childhood obesity and the, and the improvement of parks is well established. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Gandhi, if we are sued on this issue, on this issue, to defend <coughs> ourselves, we would use what color dollars to defend ourselves? General fund. General fund money. Um, but I suspect I'm in the same place everybody else is, which is the industry is not even pretending as if they're not going to sue us over this. <laughs> they're very clear. They don't think this is settled law at all. <laughs> and uh, if I also understand it correctly, we are the single city, no city, no county in the state of California has adopted this under the current settled rules. Is that right? That's correct. No public agency has enacted one of these types of taxes since the Keep Groceries Affordable Act was enacted. So it, my sense is this. I, my colleagues do great work in this, so what I would call the public health space. And, and I think you do really good work. I'm, I think this is a wonderful comma, and that's not a verbal eraser. It's wonderful comma with our eyes wide open. Uh, we're obviously doing something no city, no county has desired, decided to do. We believe if we do this and we prevail, we may be the pointy end of the spear that allows other jurisdictions to do it if we prevail. It's not going to be prevailing because our voters vote for it. It's we're going to court. And if, if I was the industry, any industry, fighting a little city, uh, I would make it a resource mismatch. And I would take it to the, to the trial court, the appellate court, the court passed that, and the court passed that, uh, to see just how far I could go and whether this little city is going to blink. Because as I understand it, we don't have the League of Cities standing behind us. I've heard the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Foundation uh, may or may not. But if I understand it, we're taking this action today with not one entity standing with us to agree to defend us on this if there's litigation. Is that right? We don't have any reason to believe that there's anybody who is committed to funding defense for the city of Santa Cruz. We have reason to believe that there may be uh, organizations or groups that will support the city in defending the litigation, but we do not have a, a contractual commitment to do so at this point in yeah. time. How does it likely? Please, please do. I'd yeah. like to hear if you have a response on that. Yeah, I, I would just say, I, not only would they maybe, they would likely, and they're already, you know, preparing for that moment. This was the second stage of the lawsuit yeah. that I was involved in yeah. that was pro bono funded by uh, folks who wanted to make sure that local jurisdictions could uphold what we have as a right in the state of California and being able to bring these types of taxes to our voters. So this is no surprise to um, folks who've been tracking this, and they're certainly standing behind us. 
Um, but we have to have something for them to stand behind before they actually get direct dollars. And they're lining those up if we are able to um, move forward to here today. Uh, thank you, that's very helpful. I uh, please, Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you. I just want to add that um, in our community engagement, we have um, local stakeholders who have also indicated that they will be supporting this should it move forward to the ballot. Supporting defense. No, or supporting on supporting. The ballot. Yes. And that's completely, oh, I suspect it's passed. <laughs> that's not my issue. I, I I'd be stunned if this didn't pass. This Financial resources campaign. is what I meant. Right. Yeah. Anyway, on the campaign side. So look, I think this is what's going to happen. I, we can foresee this, and it don't have to be James Carville to figure out the politics of this. What's going to happen is. We're going to put it on the ballot. The industry will come in and spend a million dollars against it. Some group of somebodies who are, are wonderful and committed to this will raise and put up money that will be no match for that million or more dollars. Um, uh, it'll either pass or fail. If it passes, then the industry will spend whatever is necessary to want, wander this thing through the courts for multiple years, costing us huge amounts of money to defend if we choose to defend it. All, that's my only point I'm trying to make is we've got to go into it with our eyes wide open. I don't want the constituents to think, oh yeah, you can just do this and then it's going to go, then it's going to pass and then we're going to reduce childhood obesity or whatever. It's all, it's just blue skies and sunshine out in front of us. It's not even close to that. It's dark clouds and thunder in front of us, but you're doing, you brought the right thing to us. God love you for doing that. Uh, but I predict we're a long way from ever collecting a penny and spending on it uh, to reduce childhood obesity. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Carter? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item 42, City of Santa Cruz Homeless Response Strategic Plan for July 2024 through June of 2027. I see Ms. Murphy and Mr. Imwali queuing up here. And good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. If you just give me a moment, get my trusty city clerk to help me out here. Damn right. I want to show what it did. Ms. Murphy. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor Good and afternoon. Council Members. Lisa Murphy, your Deputy City Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. It's my pleasure to uh, present to you and to the community the city's updated homeless response strategic plan. I'll be presenting to you today along with my colleague, Larry and Wally. I'm gonna do a little tag to me. So the strategic plan builds upon the foundation of our past accomplishments and carries the work forward with a more informed perspective from our past experiences. And while some of the terminology has, terminology has changed and our values have been updated to include equity, our unwavering commitment remains steadfast. This plan will guide the city's homeless response efforts over the next three years. I just want to give a brief uh, overview of some of our successes. Many of you have already seen uh, some of this information. In the 2023 pit count, and to say also to note the 2024 pit count, the details are not quite out yet. So these are 2023 numbers. 29% decrease in unhoused citizens in the city of Santa Cruz from 2022 to 2023. We've housed 121 individuals, and we've built 960 affordable units. We picked up 948 tons of trash. We service 776 people in our shelter programs. And we have 165 tent-based safe sleeping programs at the Armory and at the um, 1220 River Street Shelter. This strategic plan will be a roadmap for the next three years. It builds off of our previous work, that the amazing previous work we've done before, uh, this plan also accomplishes one of your seven strategic plan uh, goals that you set out with addressing homelessness. This plan we will come back to annually update with our status of how we're doing. And finally, this plan is in alignment with the state and the county plans. Just a little bit of background on how we 
put this plan together. Mm -hmm. uh, the city held eight uh, strategic planning process sessions with our community stakeholders. Uh, the stakeholder meetings were held with people with lived experience, city staff, uh, service providers, uh, community members, and businesses. We took all of that information and we incorporated what we heard. What we heard from the city staff and their priorities was we wanted the staff safety to be prioritized. More permanent supportive housing, expand shelter capacity with the diversity of shelter programs, continue to collaborate across all city departments. They wanted to see increased participation from the county, increased number of case managers, housing navigation, and outreach, and ongoing community education about the city's homeless response efforts. What we heard from the feedback from our um, service providers, their top priorities for our strategic planning process was expand shelter capacity uh, with a diversity of shelter programs. They want to see improved communication between the city staff and the community-based organizations when we go to resolve encampments. They'd like to see increasing of our staffing of our case managers in the, and in the region, and of course, more supportive housing. They'd also like to see assistant with collaboration across all regional service providers. Our staff met with people with lived experience in November and December. They conducted surveys and with focus groups with folks from the Armory, uh, 1220 River, and at that time, people living at Friendship Garden. And what we heard from these folks were expand shelter capacity with diversity and low barrier shelter, more day services to meet basic needs, better access to hygiene and health services, uh, access to training and classes, job support, literacy support, and more assistance navigating the complex network. And finally, in the spring of 2024, we did a community survey. It was an amazing response. We had 690 responses. Um, many of those people were also businesses. We also had about over 600 of those individuals write in responses that we went through and read each of those responses. It, it reflects a well-informed community that recognizes the complex relationship between social, economic, environmental factors. And while this was our first survey, we will be doing an annual survey to track the changes around our community sentiment around these issues over time. And what we heard from the community, the top uh, priority issues for them, accessible parks and open spaces, citizen safety, business and economic concerns, humanitarian concerns, environmental concerns, environment, uh, equitable enforcement of the law, community well-being and quality of life, clean neighborhoods and streets, more affordable housing, and service provisions for support for the in-house. Our team took all of this feedback from all of these stakeholders to help us create this new strategic plan. Just real briefly, it's not just us, and I know you all know that. It's a crisis at all levels, the national, state, county, and, and the city level. And so we tried to incorporate all of those plans and all of the data to help inform us in this plan. Again, I won't repeat all the data, but just as a backdrop in context of why we have the priorities and the goals that we set was based on what is happening in our community. 57% of the homeless population in the county lives right here in the city of Santa Cruz, and I know you all know that. And just briefly from the, the pit count, why? What are the causes? The majority of homeless in our county are white, male, over 25 years old. And why are they homeless? I hear this all the time when I'm meeting with people. 35% is due to a lost job. 24% is because of substance uh, use. 19% was from eviction. 13% from a divorce or breakup. It's important to understand what are the causes and what else contributes to the homelessness in our community. The survey also reported self-reporting of individuals who are experiencing homelessness and what are their current conditions. 46% do identify themselves with substance use disorders. Almost 40% have psychiatric or emotional conditions. 38% with PTSD. 34% with physical disabilities, on and on and on. It, it's heartbreaking when you're out there, and I know many of you, I went with you on the pit counts, and you see this. It is heartbreaking to watch what's happening in our community and the state. I want to show you that this plan aligns with, um, with the county, where it lines up. I've identified in our strategic plan, I want to outline it here, in decreasing homelessness, uh, prevention of homelessness, and building regional capacities. We have shared goals, and we're working together diligently to meet the needs of this community. 
And I just want to give a couple other little uh, brief outlines of what we're doing together. We are uh, working together in lobbying. We worked together to create the severe weather shelter last year, and we will do it again this year. Thank you for passing that in your budget. We're working together with the county the Coral Street Navigation Center. As you know, the city was awarded an encampment resolution grant, and our, we're working with Housing Matters and, and the county to implement that grant. And as you know, we meet biweekly in coordination meetings. Uh, several of you work on the, on the Housing for Health Policy Board, and our outreach staff support with the county during encampment closures and service connections. With that, I want to jump right into the actual plan, the heart of the plan itself, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Larry and Molly. Good afternoon, Mr. Amwali. Thank you for your good work. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, Larry Amwali, Homelessness Response Manager. Uh, so what Lisa described really is, is the context, the information, the input we received as we set about to update the action plan that uh, we adopted two plus years ago, really trying to take what we've learned, what we've accomplished, uh, the work of our partners, making sure we're aligned with the state, and I think importantly, as we talked about, the community engagement, the stakeholders we engaged for this iteration of the strategic plan. So we're really getting more diverse perspectives that are really informed how we've gone about this. So the framework for this process really is building on um, our commitment, um, which is connected to our values. Um, you'll we'll also see that in this strategic plan, we've articulated some broad goals that we hope to achieve through our strategic plan. And that really focus and drives um, our action areas that um, organize the strategies, the specific activities that we're doing to have an impact on homelessness. So our updated commitment statement um, is in Santa Cruz, our homeless response will strive to balance individual needs with broad community impacts, spanning from prevention strategies to successful pathways to stable housing. And so we modify that really to reflect the spectrum of the work that we're engaged in. Our updated values include health, safety, collaboration, as Lisa mentioned, equity is now explicitly in our values, environmental stewardship, transparency, economic vitality, and fiscal responsibility. So we've articulated broad goals in this plan, uh, what we're really trying to achieve. We're trying to uh, decrease homelessness uh, in our existing homelessness. We're trying to prevent new homelessness, um, and as part of the strategies, increasing affordable housing units. Housing is the solution to homelessness. Um, and reduce the impacts of encampments and protect our environment, um, and continue to build regional capacity and partnerships to do this work. And so the action areas that we've developed uh, to organize our strategies to work towards those goals, um, we continue to have five, but we have re labeled and reorganized some of these compared to the action plan. Uh, so we continue to have building capacity and partnerships, uh, affordable and supportive housing, which is slightly modified from permanent affordable and supportive housing in the action plan. Uh, environmental stewardship, um, which was part of care and stewardship previously. Um, shelter care and support um, instead of basic support services. Uh, and finally, community safety, which uh, was a category, one of our focus areas last time. And really what we tried to do, the big change here is really trying to clarify our strategies between last time basic support services had elements of both environmental stewardship and care for people. So now shelter, care, and support is really about focusing on our work with people. Environmental stewardship is really focusing our activities on um, our protection of the environment, and our open spaces um, and our streets. Uh, so I'll go quickly through each of the five focus areas and give you a sense of some of the updated strategies. Um, they're all articulated in the full document that's in your packet, but I wanted to highlight some of the work to give you an idea of what we've changed and what's been updated um, in this iteration of the strategic plan. So building capacity and partnerships is really about our commitment to collaborating both internally across city departments and externally with our community partners. Um, through the first two plus years, uh, really a lot of our work in terms of building capacity was focused internally, building our teams, 
um, building out our outreach team, building our um, police departments, homeless response team, our public works field crew, to be able to do this work um, across departments. So in this uh, updated strategic plan, really now that we have that internal capacity in place, putting more effort in terms of building our community partnerships, working with CBOs, faith-based organizations, and continuing, importantly, to work with the county and making sure that our work is aligned. Um, community engagement, getting feedback from community to make sure that uh, the services and programs that we're doing um, are efficacious and are working and meeting the needs of the community, um, as well as continuing to look for um, and establish sustainable funding sources. Affordable and supportive housing. Um, again, as I mentioned, you know, the, the solution to homelessness is really housing and having appropriate housing um, that's accessible to everybody. Uh, Santa Cruz is a leader in the state in terms of affordable housing, pro-housing designation, meeting RENA goals at all income levels. So continuing and building on that work is important in um, the next three years of the strategic plan. I think importantly, too, in this updated strategic plan, uh, we put more explicit focus on prevention efforts. Uh, really one of the dynamics that we're seeing now is we're having as a community, as a region, and I think this is true across California, more success in getting people from homelessness into housing than ever before. Uh, the problem is people are losing their housing at a greater rate than we're able to move them through the system. So putting more focus and attention on prevention efforts, which are much cheaper to keep people in their housing rather than the interventions that are required once they lose it. Um, and also, sorry. Uh, uh, an updated strategy is really, um, and this fits with the feedback we turned about the services and supports needed to navigate the system. But since our first action plan, you know, we had the resources uh, to be able to acquire 125 Coral Street. That is really the location um, that we're working towards building um, a navigation center for North County to serve uh, unhoused residents in Santa Cruz in particular. So that's an important strategy moving forward uh, in this next three years as well. Environmental stewardship, again, protecting um, our environment and our streets from the impacts of encampment. Um, and again, updates um, from the previous one is really focusing on um, trying to reduce the impacts and neighborhood concerns that we have from litter and refuse from encampments, um, continuing to do outreach to folks on, and educate around um, uh, trying to mitigate those impacts, and also talking about wildfire and flood protection and the intersection with homelessness on this space. Uh, the third focus area is shelter, care, and support. This is uh, one of our real emphasis is, um, in the city's role is in shelter and trying to, if we think about the continuum of trying to work to resolve homelessness, so really continuing to, as a strategy to reduce the number of unsheltered, uh, continuing to operate shelter programs, so continue the city overlook, River Street, um, and our safe parking programs as well as really connecting people to the behavioral and medical services that are needed to support them. Um, and as mentioned, trying to have the, the wraparound supportive services to assist people in navigating really this complex web of social services that is required to be able to uh, effectively move on that pathway towards housing. Uh, and the final focus area is community safety. Again, this is, we heard community safety as a priority in the community surveys. Uh, we heard it um, from our residents. We heard it from staff in our stakeholder interviews, um, as well as um, concern in the community for the humanitarian concern for those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, so this continues to be um, a focus um, and really working to continue on equitable enforcement of criminal behavior trying to decrease the number of calls to law enforcement from individuals experiencing mental health crisis. So this links with our desire to uh, uh, implement a mobile crisis response team uh, so that you have a behavioral health response rather than a law enforcement response. Um, and again, providing access to basic health needs. 
in Sunu as well, we articulated some broad goals. We had these strategies. And compared to when we adopted the action plan two plus years ago, we're in a much better uh, position and have kind of the infrastructure to really be thinking about how do we measure our success? How can we look at data um, to get insight on the progress we're making on these goals? So this uh, slide shows the five goal areas that we've talked about and articulating some measures that we'll be looking at to be able to evaluate where, whether we're having the progress um, and getting traction where we want to with this uh, strategic plan. And that concludes our presentation, and we welcome your questions and comments. Mr. Imwali, Ms. Murphy, thank you very much. Uh, challenging, complicated issue uh, politically policy, socially, very difficult to deal with, but thank you for being so consistently ethical and providing us with good advice and counsel on this. Let me start with uh, council members' questions and comments. Council members, uh, Ms. Contar johnson is recognized. Thank you. Mayor, um, I have questions and comments. Is it appropriate to do so together? Yes. Okay, yes, great. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, for the report, and of course, the great work. Um, so I just, I, I want to take that moment to thank you, and I know so many other people across all departments here at the city. Um, I also just want to acknowledge the big lift it was three years ago for us to get here. This was very controversial. We had community pushback. We had our previous council, some members pushed back, um, not for, you know, for good reasons. It's, it's as the mayor just said, um, a difficult, complex issue. But here we are three years later, and we've seen some of the outcomes, 29% decrease in our point in time count in, in a year. That's unheard of in all the years I've worked in this sector um, and, and all of the indicators that you mentioned. So thank you to you guys and for the council and to just everybody in the community. Um, I do have some comments and questions, so I'm going to go kind of by topic area. Um, the removal of the debris, who, who do we typically contract with? Is that, is that um, sort of as needed, or do we have city staff? How does that work? Uh, it is a combination of city staff and vendors, contractors that we have, depending on the nature of whatever the, the refuse is in a particular encampment. So okay. we have a five-person public works field crew when it's fully staffed uh, that is on the streets every day really dealing with abandoned uh, campsites, refuse in their streets. Um, and then larger jobs is when we bring in vendors um, that are needed to be able to tackle okay. that kind of volume. All right. Um, a, a, a suggestion to connect with the uh, Labor's International Union of North America, Local 270. I know they do encampment, large encampment cleanups um, in Santa Clara County and maybe Monterey County. And I can make that connection if it's appropriate when the time comes. Thank you. Um, okay, the next area is the shelter and care. I think it's so incredible that we have, you know, over 160 shelter beds. Um, and 24-7, and different than what we initially put forward in our framework as just overnight. So that's incredible. Um, and it's great to hear and see that we have people moving into housing. My, I guess my question and comment is, um, how deeply are we um, coordinating and collaborating on that handoff, that handoff for case management and real wraparound services, because that's not the role of the city. That's not what we do. We have light touch outreach, as I understand. How are we doing that with, for example, organizations like Housing Matters? Vice Mayor um, Golder and I had an opportunity to go visit their campus. They're doing great work. Um, you know, the county, uh, I forget what they're called now. They were called Housing Navigators, but connectors, yes. county connectors. So what are we doing to deepen that partnership and, and get more folks into that wraparound case management and into permanent housing? Thank a lot of that. questions. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And, um, you know, please let me know if I don't uh, address every aspect of that. Um, I think first and foremost, the way that we're ensuring those strong connections, I mean, it's, it's the work of our outreach team that is out on the streets. Um, and also operating 1220. So they are the referral connection to the shelters that the city runs, but their work is not limited to just connecting uh, folks who are experiencing homeless to city shelters and they encounter folks. 
they have robust relationships with all the different home service providers and are really looking at what's the appropriate and necessary linkage that they can make for the people that they're working with. And so um, they are in constant contact, whether it's housing matters, up at the Overlook uh, with Salvation Army, with People First, um, with Janus, HPHP. So they're really involved in that work. And that was their role, is trying to connect people to those other services. And do we capture that? I can't remember now in the, in the indicators that we've listed for measuring success. Is that something that um, we capture as an indicator? If not, can we add that as an indicator? Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. So presently, we don't have an indicator specifically around uh, the number, I guess, of connections or how many people we've connected to other services. Um, uh, but we can certainly look into that. I think one of the just immediate challenges, we've try, been trying to rely on HMIS, and so the outreach work that city workers do, it's sort of, it's not within a program. And so until somebody's enrolled in a program, they're not tracked in the system. So most of their work is that front end, getting people attached to a program, so okay. then we can begin to evaluate outcomes. But I think it is a good metric of the work that our outreach team is doing. Okay, great. Um, one other question is there's mention of the mobile crisis response program and team. What's the status of that? Thank you for that question. We've been working with the county. The county received funding for the program. They're getting ready to launch their hiring. So the county will run a county-wide program, and there'll be three teams, uh, and it will slowly ramp up. We're going to use our uh, opioid funds to help augment that team in the downtown, specifically in the downtown corridor. Uh, we're going to let them ramp up a little bit before we then add what we'd like to add as an EMT to that to do some uh, immediate triage for, for folks, again, to help prevent having to bring out fire as well as law enforcement. So they're already starting to roll. I'm actually looking forward to a possible press release coming out pretty soon about um, when they really actually hit the streets. Great. We're looking for a location downtown uh, to house as well. And... Um, also outfitting um, a vehicle, again, using our opioid funds. Okay, great. All right, just a couple more comments, and I'm almost done. Um, um, I just want to, um, I, I want to stress, I mean, you brought this up on one of the slides, that, you know, there's a spectrum of a homelessness, and there's a lot of causes and reasons, and what, what I think we see and experience in our city as street homelessness, and those who choose to, um, choose to live in encampments and not go into our shelters is because of unmet substance use and mental health needs. I mean, that that is just, it's, it's very apparent to, I think, anyone who is walking the streets and goes into those encampments. So um, great that we're coordinating with county mental health and with our CBOs, and I think it's just more work there and deeper work there. Um, I'll say this, I say it, um, I'm now on the Housing for Health Policy Board that it really is going to take all of the jurisdictions. Um, I think there was something in the gender report that we carry a huge percentage. Like, what's the, st what's the status? 56% of the city's homelessness. Um, and, and, and so we do a lot of the lifting. And um, we're not going to, we did, we've done a lot and we've come a long way, but we're not going to make, continue to make progress unless other jurisdictions across the county um, work in, in concert with us. Um, and then, okay, two more things. Um, um, environmental stewardship. I would really, really like to see us think creatively about bringing some type of the park rangers program. I'm looking at city manager Matt Huffaker because he's heard me say this. Um, I know we recently passed our sales tax measure, which is probably already accounted for. Um, if the county um, wildlife mitigate, well, I can't remember the name of the measure passes, there's an opportunity there. But I would really like us to think out of the box for um, revenues for that program because it will then relieve our PD and our fire for the environmental stewardship piece. Um, and then promise the last piece around measuring success. Um, I hope that our measurements are aligned with what we're asking for core outcomes as we are funding folks to um, help with this as we're funding CBOs. And then a couple of other suggestions for um, measuring success is indicators around grant dollars that we brought in, and then um, the development and implementation of MOUs with neighboring jurisdictions. Okay, sorry, that was a lot. No, all right, all right. Very good, Council Member Bruner, I believe you were next. Thank you. Um, thank you for the update and the information and um, 
you know, when I came on as a new council member, this was um, something that we did a big first. And um, seeing the last three years as a first for the city of Santa Cruz um, just speaks to how the needs of our residents and our community members have really risen and the resources and support have not risen at the same scale. And I really um, would like to thank City Manager Matt Huffaker, um, who when as a brand new city manager and myself as mayor, stepped into this arena because it was clear we had to do something. And so I know that this is ongoing. I, I echo the um, statements of this is not just something we can do and continue to take on. It will take everyone. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'm always looking at, at um, where are the gaps? And um, how do we get reports on the gaps? And how do we advocate for the gaps? How does the community advocate for the gaps? Who do they advocate to? Um, I think that that's something that could be helpful in understanding um, um, because we have a lot of great programs, a lot of great um, organizations doing a lot of great work. I know um, there's a lot. I don't even, I always learn about some new formation of a new group. And so, um, but I also see every day that there are gaps and and how do we you know we we talked earlier about a healthier Santa Cruz and healthy looks many different ways and always looking at ways where our residents can live healthy and um, you mentioned job loss and substance use I believe were the number one um, causes according to the data and the reports and um, so how, how how is it how are we investing in those areas if if that can be really called out in this next three year strategic plan um, in terms of the prevention right um, and then um, environmental stewardship I'll just comment um, thank you for making this plan people focused, but I think it's really important to call out the environmental stewardship. Um, and so thank you for calling that out. I think clean teams um, are and um, preservation of natural habitats um, and, uh, you know, is, is super important to call out while I applaud the people the people focus of this, um, I'm glad that was in there as well because that, that's a big part of what Santa Cruz is. Um, I look forward to hearing more about um, the thoughts and ideas around the opioid funds to be spent um, and how that could be spent and reinvested. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. I know. Um, there might be some more uh, comments, and thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you for the presentation here today, and um, your the basis for that. I think being the the document that we, was in our agenda packet, um, really comprehensive, really looks at um, and identifies the progress that's been made. Um, and I do want to just just go back to a, a comment that Council Member Kalantari Johnson made because I think you know for someone who's really versed in this, I mean I've been looking at this stuff and wrestling with these uh, issues for quite a while now. Um, but <clears throat> so I can see progress, right? It's it's legible to me. Um, but I do think that. Um, you know, as we move forward, looking at ways to find, you know, how to use those metrics to, to show the progress that's being made, right? Like, we got a number, 729 tons, I think, of, tr of tr refuse. Um, that's big. It sounds like a big number, but, um, you know, how does that 
you know, in what context, right? Um, so there's just one example. Uh, so, you know, I think, and as we move forward and, the, you know, the, the programs develop and solidify, it will be easier to kind of pull, tease those out and, and you all have more experience. Um, but I do think it's important to hold ourselves to the same standards that we're asking of our CBOs uh, re related to, the, you know, pro demonstrating progress. Um, and um, I think most of my questions were answered. Actually, I'm, I wanted to ask about the mobile crisis response. Um, it sounds like the, the plan is to work with um, the county through the Family Services Agency contract. And I love this. I just want to call this out, the, having an EMT. Um, every time I hear a siren, and I hear a lot where I live, right by the levee, um, you know, I think, well, here comes a fire engine as well. And what is the cost of that every time we have even, you know, a relatively minor call? And so I just, I have a lot of optimism about how this program is going to help facilitate, um, you know, better outcomes for people, um, but also look, reduce costs for the city. And so thank you on that. Um, and I think, you know, all there, it's called out throughout the, the document where we are trying to develop leverage partnerships, work with CBOs and our other partners um, at you know, other public agencies. Um, so, you know, I I hope that we can um, kind of call, call out the progress that's made as a result of you know those the, those community partners as well. I, I'm thinking in particular of the CBOs. I mean, if the state gives us money, which I heard they're going to give us a little bit. Uh huh. Um, that's great, but um, you know the 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 nonprofits that are doing this work and you know getting getting people um, you know service directly served. Um, so you know just finding ways to support them um, kind of holistically, I guess. Thanks. The vice mayor is recognized. Thank you. Um, Thank you, everybody, for your presentation and for your questions. Um, w there's a couple of thoughts that I have here. With the, with, and I don't know if it's already happening, but it occurred to me that maybe all of the, the nonprofits that get some of our core funding might not be using the HMIS system. And so I don't know if that's happening now, but if it isn't, I would like to see that. Uh, moving forward because I think it's really important for us to know who these individuals are in order to measure our growth and our progress. In addition, um, I'm, I know that we're using it, but I would love for us to just also, and I don't know if this is already happening, I didn't see it highlighted, collaboration with probation. Um, you know, when I looked, I mentioned before that Megan's Law, and I just looked again right now, about 25% of the individuals on there are registered as transient, and several of them are out of compliance. And so I think when we're helping people, we need to also help the people that are out in our community to be safe. It's clear um, people want safe places to go when they said they wanted safe parks. Um, I have concerns with the idea of a low-barrier shelter. To me, that I just that just screams chaos and drug den and enabling, but that is maybe just me, I don't know. Um, when I, another thought I have is, I've said before, when I deal with just the community of families that come through my school, um, I can think of three families that came through my school this year with multiple children. They moved to Santa Cruz without a plan. They had no place to live. They didn't realize it was expensive. I don't know why they moved here. Whatever the reason was, they ended up homeless, essentially, and going through the system and getting whatever services we have here. And so when I think about that, um, I, I, I don't know how to, to talk about that, but I think continued advocacy at the state level that people aren't sending people here um, from other jurisdictions, essentially, is what the way I, I saw. Um, like my colleague here said, to whatever extent we can partner with the Housing Matters Campus um, in their in their work and sending people from River Street to there um, or from the Armory to there so they can um, get homeward bound or they can get um, access to wraparound services. Uh, that is really important to me. When I was reading the, the consent agenda, I saw we were paying for food up at the Armory. I'm assuming these folks could be eligible for SNAP benefits. I don't know if they're getting those or not, but getting 
people's cards in people's hands so they can buy their own food and maybe that could come up so that we're not spending I think it was four hundred thousand or something on food like that's that's a that's no small chunk of change um, I really appreciated the environmental component I just think sometimes we look like hypocrites when we're turning our heads and not looking at what's happening in our levees and river waterways and and in the parks but we're working worried about the leaf blowers like it doesn't equal out to me um, and I am wondering how else we can look at partner with code enforcement or law enforcement with for people that just aren't ready and just choose to live on the streets I've saw um, an encampment that's been at Riverside in San Lorenzo for I feel like a couple of years now why like people <laughs> like move along I don't know what the answer is if they're not ready I don't know how to solve that I am um, a very vocal supporter of the Homelessness Drug um, Addiction and Theft Reduction Act that's going to be coming forward on the ballot this fall. And to me, I don't understand why public safety has to be a bipartisan issue. It's something that everybody wants us to live in a safe city and wants to see people healthy. And whether you're the person living in the encampment or the people walking by it, it's not healthy for anybody. And so we, what we've been doing for uh, at least the last decade and several decades isn't working. And so for me, this is time to, for us to look for a change. And um, I hope as fellow Democrats, you will help you know, support this act. And, um, and that is all I have to say. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Ms. Bruner, we, we, okay. Ms. Watkins, I know you had a follow-up comment. Yeah, Ms. I Watkins. just have a few comments. I think I appreciate the questions and comments that have been raised. Um, and I appreciate the report. I also just want to agree with um, how we're measuring success and how we're telling the success story to Councilmember Brown's point and to Councilmember Calendari Johnson's questions around alignment. I think that's really important because what you'll hear sometimes in a narrative is like it doesn't feel different or it doesn't, they still, it's a very visible population, right? And so they're experiencing it in a different way. And so that is needed in terms of context for where we've been and where we are. Um, the other is, I think, you know, when possible, we need to talk about transition to independence. I mean, I know we um, have certain individuals in our society who won't be independent and certainly need supports and we have infrastructure for that and we need to you know, clearly expand that infrastructure and some of the work, and I know I saw in the report is about job training and just ability to have independence and, and be out of, of homelessness and off um, some of the uh, services that they are needing at this time. I appreciate the alignment to the strategic plan and core and the county's programming. I think we all need to kind of be heading in that same direction. Um, and that said, I think a strategic plan is great and it has to be operationalized and it needs to be adaptable. And so um, my hope would be that as we move forward with this plan and implementation of the plan, that we have thresholds of measuring if what we're investing in and what we're doing is making an impact and if it's not then how are we able to pivot and shift in a way that's going to actually produce the results we want to see I think sometimes we just sort of stick to it because we've been doing it that way and it feels like that's the way we do it so but it's not it's not leading to what we need to have um, done in terms of success and lastly I've sat on the homeless um, for health uh, advisory board and I know there's a lot of restrictions with a lot of the federal funding and um, I'll be the first to say and I think I probably said it there too it's somewhat frustrating because it feels like you want to do this you want to do that but you're like nope you can't do it with that funding you can't do it with this funding and sorry like it's just not going to work with this funding and it's just sort of like really you know and so as much as we are aligned with the county and all of these bigger efforts that we look at ways to have independence and flexible options locally um, so that we can make the investments in the things that we need without no pretty much from some of the different funding sources. So um, that said, I just appreciate the report. I appreciate the work. And um, yeah, we have a lot to do. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Newsom. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, I just, uh, I don't want to echo uh, the comments of my colleagues. I do want to um, thank you for this report and thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, and I do want to make a, a quick comment that I've noticed, or you know, just going through the report, something that really stood out to me was obviously the need for housing in our community and affordable housing and how that can help with 
dealing with this issue, but also the need for strong programs that can prevent people from falling into homelessness or programs that help them retain housing, such as uh, the Emergency Eviction Prevention uh, Program, which we, um, uh, if we remember, we took some of the money from this sale of the land for the hotel project, which was a little before us, to actually expand that program, the reach of that program, or who's eligible, and the generosity or the amount of um, aid that they receive as well through that program, and then tied some of that future uh, TOT tax from that hotel program, to, or from that hotel to keep that program um, uh, permanently expanded. Uh, so I hope as, as that comes along, that helps with this helps with this issue and helps keep people to retain housing. And um, just more generally, thank you for all of your work. Thank you. For the members, I'll re reserve my comments for a little bit later. Let me see if members who are with us, members of the public who are with us, wish to provide comment on this item. This would be your opportunity to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online on this item? Nobody with their hand raised. Okay. Anyone who wishes to provide testimony on this item? Last call. Matters back before the body, pleasure of the body. Ms. Bruner. I move um, that motion to approve the City of Santa Cruz's Homelessness Response Strategic Plan covering July 2024 through June 2027. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a second by Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson. Ms. Bruner, you may open on your motion. I just um, want to thank city staff for all the components and clearly defining um, and breaking it into breakable pieces. And I think um, we've all made comments. Um, we've, you know, given direction, alignment, um, and prevention, and um, really having flexible funding to support. We really need to continue investing in the needs of our residents and our people, and especially, um, you know, our are very, very um, the people with the most needs. And we have um, a lot of people. So I'm really excited um, to see the investments um, that are laid out. And I know it, nobody commented on it just now, but our investments in housing over the last couple of years, and we have over 800, you know, very low-income housing I, I want to stop saying units and homes, homes being built for people and already even just connecting outside of the city right in the um, um, uh, Live Oak County area. There's a new housing, low-income housing development there in partnership with Tientes and Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. And I know about seven uh, city residents that qualified and are now living there. And one of them was 30 years chronically unhoused downtown. So, um, you know, keeping those partnerships, keeping that alignment, keeping um, the needs of, of our people front and foremost and investing in ways we can. So thank you. Thank you, council members. Other council members on this item? Soon, uh, Mr. Imwell, if I could ask you just a couple of quick questions here. Um, the uh, anecdotally, I've heard that the pit count in the city is about what it was last year. Is that about right? It's uh, we had a very significant reduction last year, and that's more or less held. Is that the the case? The preliminary data that's been released by the county so far just speaks to countywide, and so that is true countywide, where there's been a small increase, I think 40-something people countywide, about a 2.5% increase. So don't have specific data, but anecdotally, I think that is accurate. Right. Okay, so something, when you get a roughly 30% reduction, and you can hold that, Admittedly, two data points does not necessarily a trend make, uh, but I think we should be encouraged by that, that perhaps what all the governmental entities, all the nonprofits, all the association of faith communities, everybody, everybody's doing, maybe it's making some impact in a positive way. Um, 
uh, did we do this earlier today? Did we approve the new contract for the armory? Yes, and we that's did. what with what used to be called the free guide and now is renamed something else. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, they're now known as People First of Santa Cruz County, okay. but formerly the Free Guide. All right, I'll I'll return to that issue in just a moment. Just a, a small detail on that. Um, you know, after I haven't been very, here very long, uh, but it does strike me that there are things cities are good at and things that are county that counties are good at uh, when it comes to this particular topic, and the entities best designed to deal with the topic of homelessness is county government everywhere in the state of California. That's who's designed to do that. They're a subdivision of the state of California. They are required to deliver state and federal health and human services. They have vast agencies with departments and programs and so on underneath them, all designed for people's health uh, and well-being. And I think that if you're a large city, maybe there is a larger expanded role for you in this space. Um, I think a small city that does not have a health department, does not have a social service department, that what we should do is stay in our lane and those things that we are designed as a small government to do and not pretend to be some small version of county government. Uh, we should stay as a municipal corporation doing those things we're good at. My sense of what those things are is that we can be most impactful in the area of the navigation center, permanent supportive housing, and shelter. Those are the three areas we can do a lot in. Um, and I think we have done good work across the board on the shelter issue, even during the, these challenging times economically and what we're trying to do with the state and the current budget and so on. But that's a, that's a very important topic. Um, as members here know, I've said both publicly and privately that before I leave here in uh, December of 2026, it's my goal to have on the ballot an affordable housing funding measure which as a component part of that has capital outlay funding for a significant contribution to a navigation center at the roughly the Housing Matters Coral Street site and some number of stories of permanent supportive housing. I think that's a, a very important role for us. We can, through a ballot measure, form capital uh, that maybe the county can't on a countywide measure, I suspect they don't have the voter support to pass a similar kind of measure on a countywide basis. I don't believe the support is there for them. I could be proven wrong. But I think the support is there for us on an affordable housing measure, which contains a bucket of funding, a couple of buckets, big buckets for affordable housing but a smaller bucket over here for the city's contribution towards a navigation center and permanent supportive housing. And I think we should continue down that path. My very small item on the new contractor at the armory is that there be a provision in there that would allow any council member or the mayor to visit the site anytime so long as they check in uh, with uh, whoever the authorities are that are managing the site at any given moment. So I would like to add that in when we get to the motion has been put on the table. I would appreciate that if that could be provided as additional direction. Is there any objection to that? We have an objection. Then that will be included. Uh, in this with regard to uh, to our homeless program that whoever operates the armory and the lookout, uh, the overlook campground, that uh, any member of the city council or the mayor can visit there anytime provided that they check in with the appropriate authority when they get there. In other words, there is no need to make an appointment to do this. Are we clear on that? Okay. Further questions or comments? Clerk will call the roll. 
members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Commentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Weber? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. We're on item 43. This is the Monterey Bay Area Regional Climate Project Working Group. Uh, Dr. Wise West is here with us to present on this item. Dr. Wise West, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. I just need to switch over. From of course, of course. Take your time. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council members. I think our private conversation. No, no, <laughs> no problem whatsoever. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we needed a moment, but, but we're no problem. Just down to a bare quorum, so go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I realize we are the last item here I know, today, I and I, I was looking at you thinking I'm sorry. It's going to go. It'll be very quick, though. I just have a short presentation. I want to share with you um, an exciting. Um, working group that we have stood up with other jurisdictions in our region uh, that truly embodies the Health and All Policies uh, Initiative um, and its focus on equity and uh, climate. And I want to update you on the group's activities and in particular a project that we just completed. So the Monterey Bay Regional Climate Project Working Group was stood up last year. It is a consortium between Santa Cruz, San Benito, Monterey Counties, Watsonville, and the City of Santa Cruz, and I'm excited to say Capitol is joining us next fiscal year. Um, our sole purpose is to collaborate together to bring down transformative scale climate investment from the windfall of federal and state funds that have been available the past couple of years, acknowledging that we are more competitive going together on our mutual priorities than going as little entities for these big pots of funding. Um, we have organized to each give annual contributions that has enabled us to hire grant writers and strategists to help us with the capacity issues that we have. Um, and Santa Cruz County is becoming the fiscal sponsor. We use consent-based decision-making and in 2023, we wrote over $30 million in grants. We have landed $3 million, and we have $15 million pending right now. So we're going for it, big, big scale. Um, however, in order to start that group up in a quick kind of way, we put together a charter. We invited folks from CBOs and environmental justice groups to work with us, but we didn't have a formal structure for how decision making was going to happen in an equitable way. And so we, I, we got a grant from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network to conduct this project called Advancing Equitable Decision Making on Climate Investments. And that consisted of three workshops between February and May. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Martin Watkins, who participated in one of those three workshops, where we had staff from all the jurisdictions, as well as some observing jurisdictions like Gonzalez and Salinas um, and Capitolo, who we were able to bring in, as well as 11 different CBOs and environmental justice groups to work together to achieve these three goals. Number one, to secure commitments from all of our jurisdictions for three more years of funding of this group uh, based on the success we've had, to continue to build trust and relationships with CBO and EJ groups, such an important piece to this work. And we know that this, these efforts are largely unknown, so we really wanted to try to cultivate elected and executive champions by inviting their participation in this quick workshop series. And each of the jurisdictions are doing just what I'm doing today, presenting to their board or their council so that you all know what we're working on and you can help champion for us. Um, so I do want to point out that this is really an intersection of the Regional Climate Project Working Group that this group I'm talking about and a newly stood up Monterey Bay Climate, uh, I'm sorry, Climate Justice Collaborative or the CJC. This really, this project happened at the intersection of those two groups. By the way, we helped support and stand up the Climate Justice Collaborative also. 
Um, in our area, Ventures, uh, Community Bridges, the Housing Authority, a number of CBOs participated across the Monterey Bay area. And what were our project outcomes? We had two outcomes. Number one, um, we developed a, a guidance document developed around a, equitable engagement and decision making, really uh, coming out of those workshops and what we heard from CBOs. We did a lot of listening. Um, and then we have eight commitments to CBOs and EJ groups moving forward. So things that we need to work further on ensuring compensation for their participation, inviting them to developing our prioritization of what grants we're gonna go for, invite them to developing roles for themselves um, within these grants and so on. So eight different recommendations, those are contained and more in the attachment that was included with this item. Um, let's see, what else? Now that the, this grant project is complete, we're moving on to uh, one of the grants we received from the office of um, the governor's office of planning and research, which is to develop climate adaptation, implementation, and funding plans. So really focusing in on how are we going to fund adaptation and resilience for our mutual priorities across all the organizations. So I'm really excited that we're moving into that next and more to come, but that's all I have for you. I just wanted to update you on, on what we did and what we're doing um, and hope that um, we can continue to have your, your support. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have or any feedback that you might have on any of the materials that were included with the agenda report. Dr. Weisswiss, thank you so much. I suspect there may be some, so let me see if we can, uh, uh, let me see if we have questions around here. We're moving ourselves around. Uh, Ms. Brown, question, comments? I, I, I don't really have questions. I do have a couple of comments. I thought I'd wait um, until we have, if, if anybody in the audience, IO, <laughs> is interested <laughs> in speaking, um, and just wait for the comment section, but um, sure. yeah, sure, that's fine. Mr. Bancho, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. Hi, council. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, my name is Ayo Banjo. I sit on the Climate Action Task Force, um, and I'm here just to support this plan, uh, the RCPWG. Uh, I'm reminded of this African proverb, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that like really encapsulates like the essence of this project, really a mission to serve and create inclusive, equitable, sustainable solutions. That's everything that I'm about. Um, and as a person that's really embedded in our community and somebody who's in this task force, I can speak firsthand to um, the importance of having um, these groups come together to make these collective governance models. These models that not, not only turn your $20,000 into $30 million of grants applied, um, that's a great ROI, um, but also also are, are inclusive in the way that we you know bring people with us and so uh, working with Tiffany here and in the future I want to make sure that we continue to have these voices at the table and so by having um, a committed uh, funding through 2027 we ensure uh, that Santa Cruz is speaking against this climate crisis and fighting against it by reinvesting our funds where our values are and so I just want to go ahead and you know reaffirm everything that Tiffany has said and support as a climate action task force member this plan and hope that City Council does uh, approve it. Thank you. Mr. Banjo, thank you, and thank you for participation in the task force. Very much appreciate your work there. Yes, thank you, McCurley. Thank you, sir. Let me see if there's anyone else who's with us. Do we have anyone online? We'll take the person online. Good afternoon, person online. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sabrina Lopez, and I've been a participant of the Monterey Bay Area Regional Climate Project Working Group as a UCSC Coastal Climate Resilience Fellow with the Coastal Science and Policy Program. And I just wanted to share my support as well for the great work that this group is doing. <clears throat> you know, they're working on hugely, hugely important, the hugely important endeavor of advancing equitable decision-making and climate investments, which is, as I'm sure you all know, really, really critical as we see greater and more frequent impacts of climate change. And different demographics experience environmental risk and vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities at varying degrees, you know? So it's critical to have efforts that focus on inclusive, and equitable decision making in relation to these investments. In order to account for social and economic disparities that could be and 
in many places already are exacerbated by changing climate. I think it's just so critical that we incorporate and really institutionalize equity considerations through amazing collaborative work, like what is being done here with this working group. So I just hope that the city can continue supporting these efforts. And um, I ask that you you adopt the resolution affirming and commit uh, funding um, for the additional three years. So yeah, thank you to all the participants of this working group that are super amazing. Thank you to Dr. Wise West and thanks for your time, council. That's it. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? We'll take that next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi, good evening. Hi, good uh, evening. My name is Amber Ogin, and I'm a project coordinator at Ventures. We're a local nonprofit working towards building a shared and prosperous economic future where zip code, race, gender, or immigration status do not dictate income or wealth. I'm here on behalf of Ventures to express our support for the Regional Climate Project Working Group, or RCPWG. This initiative has brought together voices from our region to address climate change and has taken steps to be intentional in its efforts to center equity. This includes efforts to strengthen relationships between local governments, environmental justice groups, and community-based organizations such as ourselves. In addition, this collaboration has already secured nearly $3 million in grants, which we heard earlier. Fantastic. Continued support of RCW, RCPWG will facilitate ongoing efforts to deepen trust with community partners and secure additional funding, which will ultimately strengthen our community's ability to respond to climate challenges. Ventures is committed to ensuring a resilient economy, which includes addressing climate impacts while centering racial and gender equity. This project closely aligns with our priorities and we're so excited to be part of this collaborative effort and ask for your continued support. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for your testimony today. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? All right, very good. The matter is back before the body. Ms. Brown. I will move the staff recommendation staff to- Staff recommendation is moved. I'll second. Second by Council Member Newsom. Ms. Brown, you may open on your motion. Um, so thank you for all of the work, really. Um, the, the, the document lays it out. Uh, it was exhausting to read, thinking about <laughs> the, the work that goes into you know, these, these process questions and how it is that people come together to um, build trust, uh, share ideas, empower themselves to, you know, to, to speak and, and to be heard. So um, I, I appreciated all of that work. Um, and I want to just, you know, commend the, you know, you in particular, Tiffany, for being, uh, you know, so pivotal to this work at the city and obviously uh, regionally to, you know, to, to provide that support for other jurisdictions that are, you know, trying to um, take some baby steps. Um, you really are the resource that, you know, and people see that regionally that you're the go-to. Um, and often I'll recommend, I'll say, oh, she's probably really busy, but you might want to talk to Tiffany. Oh, I already have, you know, I've got a message in, right? You, you really are. And so I just want to acknowledge that and that you see the importance of, um, you know, bringing groups together in this way, acknowledging them, having environmental justice groups walk alongside public agencies through, um, you know, visioning and fund development and strategic planning and all of that stuff just makes uh, it us stronger. And so I, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate that. And also to the members of our Climate Action Task Force and, and those who are coming together for this regional partnership. Thank you, it's Council Incredible, Brown. really. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. I just have a brief comment, and I just want to echo Councilmember Brown's comments. Um, thank you so much, Tiffany, for all your work and, and just driving this regionally. I mean, we've been on the front side of um, a lot of really great initiatives because of your innovation and your abilities. So I just want to also acknowledge that uniquely to you. Um, and I want to thank 
th thank you for having me participate in one. I was able to do one of the, the actual meetings. I had conflicts for the other two. And um, it was just as you described, it was really wonderful to have multiple voices coming together to talk about how we can, you know, as was shared, go together when we think about these types of uh, solutions and particularly through a lens of environmental justice, which isn't often, kind of is often an afterthought, right? And so leading in that mind is great. And I think Councilmember Kalantari Johnson can probably speak better to this as a grant writer, but you know, we have a small community, we have a small region, so it's also really strategic, as you were mentioning, to have us think you know, in alignment about how to draw some of these big dollars into our community to continue to lead in this area. So I think your evidence of the 3 million and 15 pending is like a really great example of that. And I'm really excited to see what can come out of this. And um, I think this is a really great and innovative approach to doing it. So happy to support it and thanks for your work on it. Council Member Colin Tyre Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Well, a lot of great things have been said, but I'll add to it. Um, you know, as we saw with the last item, these complex issues do take collective action, and this is uh, an example of how we can do that. So I'm absolutely in support of it. And I just want to share, I had the opportunity uh, a couple weeks ago uh, for my work work to work with Ecology Action. And of course, they talked about this group and the work of this group, and they talked a lot about your leadership. So I just want to take a moment to say, I mean, we have acknowledged it. I want to acknowledge it and just know it is noticed and recognized um, with our community partners and out in the community. So thank you for putting us, making us stretch, sometimes making us uncomfortable, and um, putting us on the forefront of climate response. Councilmember Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, not a whole lot left to say, um, but I will say that um, reading through all the materials and just knowing, you know, the ongoing work, um, I just want to speak to kind of the inclus inclusion and the um, equitable decision making and um, how that is always the intention that you start with. So thank you for bringing that to this space. I look forward to updates in the Health and All Policies Committee. And um, amazing that we could um, really um, collaborate in this way and, and really maximize the dollars um, for such a great regional impact and priority. So thank you. Welcome, thank you. For the comments. Thank you, Dr. Weiswest. Very, very good work. Uh, I join my colleague. Could I ask you a question about? Absolutely. Uh, actually, let me ask the city attorney a question about uh, in the resolution on the final page of the resolution on the, the actual resolution portion itself at the bottom. The city council of the city of Santa Cruz affirms its intention to commit to funding the city's contribution to the group annually for three additional years through fiscal year 2027, if feasible given the status of the general fund. That is the way in the event that uh, the state catches pneumonia and we catch cold and everything else, this is the way that we can say circumstances have come up which are materially different and we might not be able to do that. But absent that, this is our, our commitment. I'm assuming we reserve every single fiscal year to determine whether things are uh, sufficiently good in our general fund that we can continue to do this. Is that correct? Yes, I would say um, that is consistent with the language of this resolution. Um, additional contractual commitments that the council may make uh, on other matters related to this could be different, but as far as this resolution is concerned, that is absolutely correct. Thank you very much. It's an excellent recommendation. Gives us a little bit of a pressure release valve if uh, you know we have to start balancing all kinds of considerations. Frankly, like the state had to do this year, we were fortunate we didn't have to do that. Uh, but uh, but I think it's uh, constructed the right way. Uh, all debate having ceased, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkin. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Helen Terry Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. 
Item 44 is an informational item, and there's no need for action on this. So I believe we have come to the end. If I might be for uh, Mr. Condotti, any further business? Ms. Bush, any further business? No. If I can make one comment as we begin our summer recess, and that is to say, can you believe we're halfway through the year? <laughs> I'm having a little bit of a hard time believing we're halfway through the year. But it is an opportunity to thank uh, the city manager, the city attorney, and the city clerk, and your staff for all the support you give us leading up to, during, and following city council meetings. Uh, same thank you and appreciation goes to all of the department heads and others who are involved in the uh, never-ending agenda process. Um, also, six months into our year, uh, much thanks and appreciation to all the employees of this government who do, do such a fine job, uh, whether it's very visible work like police and fire uh, or also visible work such as parks and, uh, and public works, uh, those activities, uh, works that are less visible and support all of those activities, the folks in ID, uh, excuse me, IT and in uh, personnel human resources, um, it's uh, the only way this place can work and be as good as, frankly, it is, is that we have a teamwork approach. And over on the appointed side, uh, Mr. City Manager, it begins with you. And uh, I tell the story all the time that I'm going to tell you now. Uh, when I first began in county government and in state government uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, the institutional governmental culture kind of went like this. I'm the elected. Jeb, I have this thought and this idea, and I'm thinking we might want to do this. Back in the 80s and 90s, the answer was, we've never done it that way. We don't do it that way. The answer is no. Um, and then it was up to the elected official to fight and claw to see if they could move the institution to someplace they wanted it to be. Uh, you all know this because I'm the newcomer to this little government. Uh, beginning when I was sworn in December 2022, immediately uh, when I would meet with the city manager, the city attorney, other department heads, other people, and say, I've got this issue and I have this concern. I think I might want to go. Their answer uniformly is, that's interesting. Let us put a working group together, a team here. Let's socialize the issue, as you say, Mr. City Manager. Let's make sure we get all the touch points right, Mr. City Manager, another one of your favorite phrases. Uh, and all of that is designed to see how can we get to yes on something? How can we get a problem solved here? And uh, I want to say that is not what you encounter in every single government. Uh, it isn't. And this place uh, is special. And both the governance team, the implementation administrative team, every line level worker in this government makes us proud every day. And with that, the vice mayor moves that we adjourn for the summer, uh, for a summer break. And let's Somebody see. Somebody else has to say. You're, gonna, gonna, uh, well, you're tired of it. You want to stay here all summer. So there we go. Martine Watkins uh, with great trepidation seconds. Matter is not debatable. We'll call the roll. Those, in, uh, excuse me. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Have a wonderful summer. See you in a month. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah.